right, welcome to uh, the Atlanta Pride Fest. We're going to do a video shoot out here this weekend. And you're in the middle of uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Piedmont Park, as you can see, and thousands of people here for the uh, Pride Fest, which is the big gay and lesbian festival here in Atlanta, Georgia. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up to people and chat with you about some of their spiritual beliefs. We're going to hand tracks out. We're hoping it's going to get some good teaching tools that as you see this, you can watch and just pick up some ideas as you share your faith. Every conversation is going to be different, and our goal is to get to the cross and share what the blood of Jesus Christ did, okay? So remember, as you go out and you watch this video, you don't have to do it like I do. This can be some good ideas to add to your repertoire as you begin to stand up and be bold toward Jesus Christ. It's an amazing festival. It's very demonic. You can feel the heavy presence when you walk in. But remember something. Our God is much bigger than anything Satan can ever deliver this festival, and that's why we must stand up for that, okay? Enjoy the video as you watch it. All right, we're on the streets outside the uh, Pride Fest. So one of the things we do is uh, to get trash. We're going to show you a couple techniques in just a second. But one of the ones is when you're outside of a festival in a parking lot at a Walmart, something like that, you can take your trash and you can take them and you can slide them right into the by the driver's side of a car right there. So when people come out, they unlock the car, they'll open it up, and a lot of people don't like the litter, so they'll take it, put it in their pocket. And I've actually seen people that have sat in the car and read the entire track and done that. And so you want to get a good track uh, that's got hard, that's not a flimsy track. Uh, livingwaters.com makes great tracks, I think the best tracks. You can go there and get these types of tracks and do that. So if you just watch, we're going to walk forward here and uh, we're going to walk forward and get to some of these cars right here. And so as I just walk along the street, I'll just take the track and I'll just slide it right in there as I walk. And I just keep going down and so I can go through uh, down the street down a parking lot, you can do that in different ways and get a bunch of tracks like this. So it's a great thing to do as you're out and about. You do some talking, you hand some tracks out. A farmer knows the more seed they throw out in planting season, the more that can come in at the harvest. So if I throw a little bit of seed, I get a little bit of harvest. The more seed you throw out, the more harvest that's going to come in. So make sure you're throwing out a lot of seed to bring that harvest in spiritually for all of eternity. You guys need anything? Oh, we got it. Come on. This was Pride Fest uh, 2004, a wet, nasty, ugly couple of days. But I tell you what, it was awesome to see the faithfulness of the people out here talking with people, handing tracks out. There were so many seeds planted during this time. I do hope you're going to pray for each of the people you've seen on the DVD. But beyond that, our God was faithful. He was faithful to draw people up who had questions who we were able to talk with. Uh, some of it you'll see on DVD and some of it you won't see on this DVD. But we were able to talk to numerous people this weekend and plant those seeds. And now it's God's job to make those seeds grow. And the best thing I can hope for is that you will take this DVD, you will, as it winds up to a close here, you will hit that off button, you will walk out that front door of your house, and you will engage this culture and talk with the people in this culture and plant those seeds and pick up that phone and call relatives and write letters to friends that share the truth of what Jesus Christ has done, our sin, the judgment to come. 
the Bible, the truth of the Bible, and that we're going to boldly start standing up for Jesus Christ. Because it's obvious when you walk around and saw all the sin of this festival, that the footage you saw of the parade, Satan is boldly standing up for who he believes. And it is time, it is high time for Christians to boldly stand up, and I mean boldly stand up for what they believe. And I just hope this video is an encouragement to you to go out and do that. Our God is worth it. He stood up for us on that cross 2,000 years ago, and all he asks is a little bit of us to stand up for him in 2004 and beyond. And I hope and I pray you're going to be one of those bold people that's going to make that stand until we see him face to face or we see him crack that sky and he's coming back on that white horse. And I hope you're one of those faithful, faithful believers. And thank you very much for that. Take care and have a great life and have a great eternity with Jesus Christ. Take care. churches who try to collect money to do the Lord's work. Think about that. The average tithe in America is one and a half to two percent. We are not giving our money to the cause of Christ to get his work done out here. But you'll see people very unashamedly walking around collecting money for their events and what they believe. You know, Christians, if you're listening to this DVD, we need to do the exact same thing and give our money to causes that are going to win souls and glorify God's name and take it all across this earth. Period.
Good. How are you? Good. Hello. Okay, they've officially canceled Pride, but there's still some people hanging out because of the crazy wet weather. So we're going to get in one more conversation. Now, give us your first name. I'm Hermie. Hermie? Travis. Lynn. Brett. Brett, Lynn, Hermie, and Travis. Awesome. What's the connection between y'all? Well, we met yesterday, just being friendly. And then she came along, and so we just like all formed here magically. So, so y'all just met yesterday and become friends like that? Yeah, we've known each other for a while. Yep. But all four of us just got together at Pride yesterday and we went out to eat and have fun. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, well, why, have y'all come to Pride every year? No, this is this my is first, first year. year. This is first time. Time. Where are y'all from? Uh, I'm from, We're from around here. here. We're around from around here. And he's from. I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Okay. Yeah. Um, so basically, you're Atlanta folks, and you come down and do this, okay? Um, what's been the the highlight of the Pride weekend for you, somebody? Being with each other. Huh? Being with each other. And the rain. And the rain. Yeah. Okay. The for rain me, for me, it's just making friends. All right. It's been a wet weekend. Trust me. Uh, People are going to see this on a DVD and not know what we're talking about. It has been pouring out here. Um, has there been a, a bad side to being out here this week? No. Yes, they canceled it early. Yeah. That was very bad. And we didn't get to see the parade. Don't do it again. We saw it. <laughs> they canceled part of the parade and they uh, canceled part of the, the show up here, the Drag Queen show. Um, I noticed some tattoos. Uh, let's get a picture of that one. And what, I was trying to get, what's the symbolism on that tattoo? What's symbolism? Uh, that means that uh, no matter how bad it is, what happens to you, it was meant to happen. And there's reason for everything. So man, no matter how bad it is, it was actually meant for that to happen. Yes, sir. Okay. So you believe something along the lines of like September 11th that was meant to be? Yeah, there has to be a reason for everything. Okay, and so how do you determine what that reason is as events happen? You have to think about it and search for yourself and decide what the reason is. Okay, and so the people who died on September 11th or the families that are missing somebody, they have to figure it out themselves to do that? Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Okay. Right, cool. Um, question I want to throw out here is when you die, what do you think is on the other side? So what do you think happens after we 
exit out into eternity. That's me. All right. I think there's nothing, there's nothing that's just non-existent. So, Herman, you think we just we just unconscious over and that's it when we die? Okay. Worm food. Worm food. And would that be a buffet for the worms, or what would that be? Okay. <laughs> she got a wor worm. <laughs> Who are my best friends? Okay. All right. You look clean though. It was raining. Rain again. Rain again. Okay. Uh, Travis, what do you think happens after we die? Twenty-four-seven party. So you think it's one big party? Either that, or we come back and we just have to go through this sucky thing all over again. You know, it's interesting you say that because reincarnation and coming back is actually it's a Hindu belief, and Hindus um, actually consider reincarnation a curse that you have to keep coming back, and you don't get it right until you get to Nirvana. And in the West, we think it's a cool thing to believe in because you think you get to come back, but I think it's a curse that you actually wouldn't want to keep coming back to this crazy place that we live in, okay? Yeah? I believe in reincarnation also. Same thing come back as? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll wait and see. Just take a chance what it is going to be when you get there. Uh, maybe. Part of me wants to believe in reincarnation just so I can do it again. Maybe if I made some mistakes or if I want to do something differently, but, you know, I'll see what happens. Okay. That's kind of how I believe about it. Like, I don't believe something will happen or something won't happen. I think nothing will happen, but no one will ever know. No one can know until it's actually happened. Until it's actually so happened. I don't, have, I don't have a steady belief, just a thought. Okay. Um, a lot of reincarnation, the ones who believe in reincarnation, do you, any of you know what you were in a previous life? Um, not, no, not yet. Like, I have flashbacks sometimes, I'm not quite sure. You have flashbacks? You know, like, just, like, memories of stuff that I, like, I didn't do here, but I don't know. I'm not sure. Any of y'all know what you were in a previous life? I a pair of sunglasses. <laughs> Travis was a pair of sunglasses. Yes, I was. And any particular brand, Travis? Okay. <laughs> okay. So maybe okay. this is a really cheap $3 pair that you can get at the car. You're more valuable than that, Travis. <laughs> um, do, you, do you know what you're going to be in the next life? If you believe in car, do you know what's going to happen next? Oh. Awesome. You're going to be awesome. Yes. I'm going to be, Travis, I'm going to be born a black girl <laughs> so I can get weave in my hair. <laughs> You've got it going on. But it's just <laughs> under the bed. Oh, it's fake. Okay, all right. It's faker than fake. <laughs> <laughs> well, my question is, do you believe uh, God decides what you come back to, or do you believe you decide? Or how does that work? I don't know. I, yeah, I'm not sure. I think it's just chosen for you. I don't know who does it, or it's just chosen for you. Well, if we decide what we do now, why can't we decide if we come back or not? I don't believe in predestiny and all that, so I think we decide. See, that's what I, I was wondering with. I was talking to someone one day, and, and, and if we get to decide, why would there be any roaches or rats running around? Because who's going to say, mm, I can't be a roach in the next life and avoid those roach motels as I'm running through life? You know, it, it doesn't make sense if we were choosing that ourselves. Um, do you, uh, any of y'all believe in God? No. Atheist? Well... Like I said before, I don't believe in it, and I don't believe that there's not something, but I assume there's nothing. Just make the assumption. Make the assumption. That's all anybody can ever do, because you never know, because you never see them, you never talk to them, you never communicate. Anyway. Okay, cool. Uh, any beliefs in God or not in God? or what? Same. Same on No, I think that there was, at one point there was a God, but I don't think that they're paying attention now. and just let things run their course. Like, something to create the world, but now they just said free will. Uh, that's interesting because that's actually a thought called, and I'm missing a term there, I think it's called uh, deism. And yeah. deism is where it's like a spinning top and God pulled yeah. the thing and it's just spinning and it's kind of a hands off God. Yeah. And actually Islam kind of allies that way, just kind of a hands off. And just kind of watches it and see where it goes after that like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, you kind of semi might believe in God. Is there been any evidence that proved to you there's not a God? There's not been anything necessarily that, but there's been a lot to prove to me that Christianity is a bunch of bogus priests, and the way that society has manipulated it, it may have been different in the beginning of Christianity, but it's totally malformed since, okay. so I think that's a lot to do with my belief that there may not be anything. But there may not be something because of that. Well, that's a big part of it, yeah. I think it's huge because uh, people don't understand that a life you live can begin to impact other lives around you, both positively and negatively, uh, depending on how you live your faith out and do that. Um, do you Have you found any evidence that there's not a God? Anybody? I haven't been looking. 
Okay, so you're saying I haven't been looking. Okay, so you're not actually looking to see if there's... Have you found any evidence that there is a guy? I'm not looking. I don't care either way. That's just me. Like, I, I got me. And I have faith in myself, so I don't really have to pray every night and have hope in something else because I know what I want to do. And if I want it done, it's going to get done. So. Exactly. I believe we have the choice to choose what we want to do in our lives now because we were given will. So y'all believe in free will? Absolutely. It's the obvious thing in the world. I met someone the other day that did not believe in free will. And I said, just look at September 11th. I mean, people had the free will to get on airplanes, the free will to try to hijack the airplane, the free will to fly it into a building, and now we have the free will to live out all the consequences because of that. We most definitely have free will. All right? Um, give you something to think about. Um, every time you see a creation like new hair, okay? You know there's a creator who made that, like a necklace, okay? Every time you see design, like a watch or something like that, you know there's a designer. Every time you see uh, artwork, okay, like a tattoo, you know there's an artist that did it. Uh, every time you see order, like 20 Coke cups in a row, you know there's an order. Order. When you look around the universe, what do you see? You see creation, you see design, you see art, you see order. If every other thing had a creator, a designer, an artist, and order behind it, why would you not think there's a creator, a designer, an artist, and order behind the universe? It seems logical, but either way, it's beyond our comprehension. Um, well, well, watch. I don't really don't think it's behind your comprehension, because I think it is logical when I started searching that a few years ago. What's the, what, what's the ages? Let's see how it's made. I'm 19. 18. 17. 19. Very young, man. I used to be that age, like, many moons ago. Um, <laughs> but it was probably in college when I started doing some thinking about eternal things, all right? Uh, we're downtown Atlanta. We see those big buildings, and I think that's the, uh, at t building or something over there. You see this big building. Can you prove to me there's a builder to that building? No. Can't go you can? Well, actually, I can. Okay. How can you prove there's a builder to I can go ask my drafting teacher. Okay, well, one... I can all the buildings all over Georgia. Okay, so if you went and saw the architectural drawings and the layout and everything on there, you could see the plans, because you know you just don't pop one of those buildings up. It takes all the plans to do that, okay? There's also another way to prove that there's a building to it. You know how to do it? Internet. <laughs> <laughs> Internet's changed the world, hasn't it? Um, I found an atheist the other day in downtown Atlanta, and I pointed to a building. I said, prove to me there's a builder to that building. He said, that's easy. I said, how? He said, the building's proof there's a builder. And he's exactly right, because you just don't lay down brick and mortar and cement and lights and turn your back, and there's a building. The building's proof there's a builder. Now, look at the sun, the moon, the stars, the ocean, the sand, every snowflake individually different. Each one of you have three billion pieces to your DNA, different from the next person. But yet, if there was a builder to that simple little building, there would have to be a builder to this universe, that, this universe, this creation that we live in right now. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it really does logically, as you said, when you think about it logic. Then my question was, though, who built it? Because once you can find out who built it, then we can get a little bit more information on what might be next when we walk out of here. Does that make sense? Yeah. It doesn't matter who built it, because it's over. Now we're here, and we've been here for years and years and years, and we're still going to be here years and years later unless, you know, the day after tomorrow was right and we all die. But, you know, it's not going to be me. It's a big waste of effort to try to find it out, because no one can ever know since it's supernatural or whatever. But I think the best we can do is to find out who we are as ourselves and to go based on that. If, if God would have built all this beautifully and then pop us into it, do you think he might also give us some information on what be, might be next when we walk out of here? Maybe. Like I said, it's not worth searching for. There's more to live for right now instead of trying to live for finding out what's going to come next. Would you agree with me, though, that there's a 100% chance you're going to die? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. pretty rich. So even when we're young, sometimes we don't think that way. Have any of you lost any friends? No, you're not my friend. Have you yeah. You've lost some friends. Yeah. And uh, I used to teach school and actually had a 15-year-old um, a student die in a car accident and a 14-year-old student commit suicide when I was teaching school. And boy, when you got that empty seat in that classroom, but there's that name in that roll book that you know it should be sitting in that, and it's not there. Boy, it just makes your wheels spin about how quickly we can get out of here and go off of somewhere, okay? Because it hit me because there is a 100% chance we're going to die. I want to know what was next when we walk out of here, right? Because if there's places to go, when you want to, if you like hanging out here together, wouldn't you like to hang somewhere else together, too? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. It would make sense. Uh, have you heard of uh, uh, Charles Barkley, the basketball player? Anything? 
heard the name. Heard the name? Okay. He was a famous basketball player back in the day. But I played at basketball at Auburn University with him a few years ago. And uh, it's a true story. His younger brother had a heart attack and died. It came back. Uh, you heard about near-death experiences, white lights and tunnel people see? Not what he saw. He flatlined. His spirit rose up. He saw the flatline. He went to the weight room. He'd say, who was in the weight room? What they were saying, what they were wearing while he was clinically flatlined. Okay, so this can't just be in his head. This must be an external event. Watch what happened. He took off on a journey, and all of a sudden, he saw trees on fire, ground smoldering around the trees. He saw a lake of fire in front of him when he died. I said, Daryl, what'd you see, dude? He said, I saw hell. I said, dude, you saw hell. He'll tell you to this day what he saw is more real than this park and this festival is right here. He said, your senses work to the end of the tree. He said, you could feel the heat coming off that lake of fire. It was so intense. Do you know I've met six or seven different people that got the hell experience and not the heaven experience when they died? You ever heard a story like that before? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. several stories. You've heard a hell experience story that someone has seen when they died? Mm-hmm. Uh, what did you, what did you, uh, what they say, what they saw when they died? I don't remember any specific instances, but I've heard some. Okay. Um, because as you continue your search and do your search, uh, when you break down all the world's religions, uh, over half the people in the world believe in a heaven and a hell. Okay. When you get to Islam and Catholicism and Judaism and Christianity, over half do. My thought was, and I was searching a few years ago, is if that winds up being true, and that's what you're going to have to find out on your search, is what separates who gets one or who gets the other. That would make sense, wouldn't it? I mean, kind of, we do that when we pass fail at the 70 mark, you know? What separates, though, and of course, we hope God grades on the curve, just like we hope our teachers grade on the curve. But here's the standard that I found out that it is. Have you heard of the Ten Commandments? You heard of that? Okay. Have you ever told a lie before? Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> I had a guy tell me no one day. I said, well, there's another one. Okay. Uh, but if you told a lie, what would that make you if you told a lie? A lie. Very false witness. Very false witness. Travis, say a lie. A liar. You know, it hit me every moment that I told a lie that would make me a liar. Okay. Have you ever stolen something before? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, what'd you steal? Then? Like something from the magazines, magazines, and some makeup a long time ago. Um, I actually uh, told my mom one time that I was getting ten dollars out of her purse and took a twenty. You know, and I was stealing ten bucks from my mom. Okay, but when you stole something at that moment, that would make you a liar. It makes me a thief at that moment. Okay, have you ever lusted in your heart before? What do you mean lusted? Uh, looked at someone in a sexual way, like you wanted to be with that person. Every day. Yeah. <laughs> Every day, everywhere. <laughs> Oh, guess what? I had a guy tell me the other day that he had never lusted before. I said, well, that proves you're a liar because you're a fella in fella's lust, okay? And what'd you see? Brett? Yeah. Oh. Is that me? Oh. Yeah. We'll catch him. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Ian. And uh, turn this way. Uh, the um, I can't get him on video or without these signs. That's the problem. It just, it's, I just did a TV show in Los Angeles, and they actually invited someone from the stage up onto the show. As soon as the person walked up the stage, they ran at this person with the clipboard to get him to, uh, ran him with the clipboard. Dude, that's mine, and no one's got the number. This is really interesting. Um, ran at him with the clipboard in order to uh, make sure he signs something to get the release, or he's just going to be freaky and do that. Um, so he looked at someone in a sexual way all the time, okay? When I was studying different religions, um, uh, Jesus said, even if you look upon a woman with lust, it was the same as committing adultery, because he was going to check your insides as well as your outsides. Well, that was a pretty tough standard, looking at inside as well as outside. Okay. Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? <laughs> yeah. They smell the traps. Um. We've all, at some point, flippantly used God's name, or JC or GD. I used to play basketball and lose my cool and say something like that. Do you know in the Old Testament, do you know what they used to do to uh, people that would use God's name in vain? Do you know what the penalty was? Anybody? Cut out their mouth. <laughs> maybe their tongue? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, maybe so. Is that me? That's not me? That's mine. That's mine in the bag of that. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be a great video, I'm telling you, this is going to be a great video. Um, um, the, uh, uh, they used to stone the person to death because it was taking the, the holiest name ever and treating it that way. Have you ever been angry with someone before? Yeah. Angry with anyone today? Yeah. Because I can't surprise. What do you have to Because 
He's short. <laughs> <laughs> but he wants to be tall in the next life. Um, and what hit me was as I studied different religions, uh, Jesus said even if you've been angry with someone, it was the same as committing murder because he's checking your inside as well as your outside. I used to do prison ministry work, and I met people who have murdered before. Before they ever pulled the trigger, they'd get angry at someone over a dice game, they'd get angry over a spouse, and the next thing you know, they did something and they're off in jail for the rest of their life. Okay? So as you do your search, Ten Commandments, if that winds up being the standard, you just made you're a liar, a thief, a blasphemer, an adulterer, and a murderer by that standard. Okay? So would you be guilty or not guilty by that standard on judgment? Day? By that standard, I yeah, but Where else everything's relevant. So. <laughs> what you have to find out is if that's going to be the standard that we're going to have when we walk out of here. Yeah, I don't okay. think that's what going about, to be. Okay. You don't believe that's going to be the standard? Right. I don't think it's going to be. What right. about repenting? Now, see, uh, you're thinking like I did. Because when I looked at that standard, not only would it mean I was guilty, it would mean I would get hell instead of heaven. Like we, we were talking about that story of uh, Charles Barkley's brother. But what then would hit me was six billion of us would be going to that place unless God provided a way out. And I start studying different religions to find out what the way out is. Do you know what the way out is? In case you want to go to heaven with God, do you know what the way out is? Repenting. Repent means to turn from. It means to actually do a 180. It's a change of mind, okay? And it's to do a 180 to go away from. But that would stop me from some of the sins in the future when I repent. But I have to get cleansed of all my sin that I've committed in the past. Do you know how to get cleansed of all that from the past? When I studied the different religions, literally I could find one thing in all the religions that I studied that could cleanse you of your sin. And they actually said that the blood of Jesus Christ can wash you as pure and as white as snow. Erase all your sins you've ever committed. Okay. If, you, if all your sins were erased, does that mean would you be right with God when you walked out? Would you be okay on judgment day? I don't know. Yeah, and if you're cleansed of it, you would be fine. Here's a good word picture. Um, nice hat, okay? If you bought this hat at a department store, and I cannot think of a good department store that actually sells good headwear like that, but that's <laughs> sweet, and they left a little security tag on it, when you came walking out the front of the store, uh, what would happen? It'd go off. Okay, the alarm goes off, right? Word picture, uh, gates of heaven, same, it's like two sensors on it. When you go walking through into heaven, only one thing would set the alarm off, and that would be all of our what? Sins. All of our sins. But if you've been cleansed of all those sins, can you walk through that gate when you walk out of here? Sure. Uh, I can show you 50 to 100 verses in the Bible that you can know that's where you go when you die. Not that you hope, you can actually know that. All right? Does that make logical sense as I share that with you? Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what I want to ask you is, is what questions, because you, you seem like you had a little bit of edginess towards Christians or Christianity. Um, what questions would you, what's that? Not just Christians, it's any religion. Any religion. Because Christians in, mainly because they're the biggest, most populated one here. In America. In America, yeah. Right. Not necessarily the world, but definitely in America. Um, and what do you believe uh, Christianity to be true or the Bible to be true or not to be true? I don't believe it to be true. Okay, why is that? Because it's supposedly written in human hands and supposedly been translated, but there's no way to accurately translate anything. Uh, one of the things I had to wrestle with a few years ago, and uh, over 3,000 times in the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord. In no way, shape, or form did it ever claim human authorship. But the question I had was, anybody could write, Thus saith the Lord. Can you back it up with anything? Do you know they've yet to find a historical mistake anywhere in that book? Archaeological digs and millies have proven everything to be true in that book, you know? But here is a kicker that blew me away when I studied a few years ago. Do you know what a prophecy is? Anybody? What's a prophecy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what, it's like a guess, but yeah. written in wonderful writing and on yeah. special paper. Right. And what is it? Something <laughs> special paper. <laughs> it's something said in the past or today that predicts what? Something in the future. Okay, something in the future. Okay. This really blew me away a couple of years ago when I studied. Out of all the religious texts in the world, there's one religious text with hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of very detailed prophecies in it. Okay. Do you know what that text is? Anybody? I study the difference. Go ahead. No. <laughs> it's the, the Old and the New Testament together. The Bible together it has all these future predicted events. Okay? And do you know, out of all those future bits, that every single one of those prophecies has literally come true to the minutest of detail, except for ones about the future return of Jesus to the planet? All right? So I study the probability on that, and it hit me. There's no way man can predict the future to 100% accuracy. Only who can do that? Someone else. Okay. 
someone else. Supernatural being. It would have to be some sort of supernatural being that could do that. And that book claimed it was the God of this universe who created all this to do that. So it, what hit me was, and one of the things I really want to encourage you with, is it hit me is that I didn't have to have blind faith. That's always bothered me when I was a kid growing up. Someone said, you need to get born again. You need to get saved. I was like, why? Why can't I commit my heart to Muhammad or to Buddha or something like that? Give me some information. But when I looked at the fulfilled prophecies and the predictions of the future, okay, what I realized is I used to think it was this, this much evidence, that much faith. Okay, and when I realized when I studied, it's literally that much evidence, and you only need the faith of the muscles to put on top. All right, so as you do your search as the days continue, all right, um, I just want to say, take a look at the evidence. You do that for anything. Before you buy a car, you compare it to other cars, you make sure it's got the right warranty, you make a decision. Same thing in the spiritual realm. Take a look at the evidence and make a decision on that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it did, and no one really challenged me with that at your age to do that, and I just want to encourage you with that, all right? What uh, what can I answer for you? What can we encourage you with? Anything. You can say anything you want. Ice cream. Ice cream. <laughs> Do you want ice cream, Travis? I want ice cream. So if I bought you an ice cream, you'd be a happy dude? I would. Okay. What we're going to do? Question for yes. you. Is it monotheism that you're convinced about? Yeah, uh, when it comes down to it, there is a there is a monotheistic God out there, as the Old Testament talks about, but but in a Trinitarian form, a Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All right, and I know that because it comes from a book that can predict the future. A great way to explain that, I have a difficult time doing that. I don't know a great, simple, even a word picture to help you with that because it's just I know it to be true because I can prove the book true, but how to. Um, make that understand. I used to teach school and I had the hardest time doing that with students to try to make that understand. But why do you ask that? I was just wondering, because okay. it seemed like monotheism, but I believe, I think if there's any kind of supernatural being, it's poly. Polytheism is what you're wrestling towards. Okay. Um, and that's why we got to do the search and take a look at the other evidences. And look, we got evidence that might be rain again. Um, last question. Y'all have been great. Y'all were so used to it by now. Last question. What if you're wrong and Jesus winds up being the only way to heaven? What if you're wrong and you decide not to choose that? That's the price I paid for living my life like I wanted to. And I'm willing to accept that if it's not right, then it's what I wanted to and I was happy. Yeah, it's worth it. Yeah, it's, it's worth to have your own choice. Because choice it. is the most important thing. Choice and freedom is the most important thing. So if you party it up, do whatever you want, or, you know, work in an office building all your life and you end up, you know, you later go to hell or whatever. So what? You do what you want to do. Yeah. And that's what there is consequences. That if it winds up being true, there is a heaven and a hell, and that's a, that's not only a consequence. That's an eternal consequence that we have. And so it's worth thinking about. Just like you think about consequences when you drink and drive, you have to think about consequences when we walk off into eternity too. Does that make sense? Yeah. It does. Y'all been great. Yes, you were saying. I don't know much about the Bible. I quit the religion thing a long time ago. But I heard that in the Bible, hell is just a grave. So why is everyone making a big deal? There's going to be fire and demons and you know things like that. Uh, good question. It's man-made to me. It sounds like pain. You better eat your vegetables or else. Eat yeah. your vegetables. Well, good question. Um, it actually says uh, in the Book of Revelations that there's a, a lake of fire at the end of time that people who get the second death are going to go to that, okay? And what it means is we all die once. We physically die once, and you go before God for a judgment. And a second death is when you're separated from God for all of eternity if you've rejected what Jesus Christ has done. And then the people who get the second death, actually it's the lake of fire it calls in the book of Revelation. So it actually is described that way. And also when you meet people who have had near-death experiences of it, we just met a guy yesterday who had a, a vision and a dream at night, and it was all about hell, and it was the same type of thing, the lake of fire, and people were burning and screaming in that. It's a, what was it? It, it's a, it, it would be a scare tactic if it's not true. If it's true, then it's not a scare tactic to use that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I just want to be clear. Yeah, okay. Do you find it not, I don't know the word, but everybody pictures it as being burning and fire and stuff that's so ingrained in society and Christianity do you not find that, that if when they go to unconsciousness or see these visions or nothing that it's already engraved in there so you know it's gonna come to visual Good question y'all are thinkers I like this I love people who think um, I've, I've written papers on near-death experiences and when uh, you write a paper on a near-death experience and you want to certain near-death experiences won't have as much cooperation to it 
But which of the first corroborating evidence? Something they could not know while they were flatlined. Like when Barclay's brother flatlined, he could not know who was in the waiting room, what they were saying, what they were wearing, if he was still in his body. He can't know that. And so when you start looking at those, they can start telling you things that they had to have exited their body and gone out in order to tell you certain things. And you give those more credence to do that. And many of the people that have had the ones of the hell and have seen that have actually can tell you corroborating evidence around them to prove that to be true. So it's not just just not a gyration in the head like you were saying, which is a possibility and you are correct on that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Any of y'all, uh, last thing, any of y'all like to read? You like to read? You're readers? Okay. I'm an author of a book, so you've helped out. I'm a DVD here, and I'm going to give you a copy of my book for helping us out, okay? Sound good? All right? Good? Deal? Bye-bye. Right. Some things happened off camera after the last conversation with the Hermes and Travis and those folks. Uh, Hermes came up to me. We were chatting on the side. It really began to pour down rain. And he said to me, I want to thank you for something. I said, well, he thank you for being so professional. And what he was meaning was that just because I was caring about them and trying to share, and he said, thank you for shoving it down our throat, is what he said. Because it's obvious the way he stated earlier, something happened with him in Christianity, and I wasn't sure what that was. That's why we got to make a good example, Christ-like example, when we're out here. The second thing he said to me was, he really was thankful. He said, I've been wanting to ask those questions for so long, and finally I got to ask them to somebody. Remember when we're witnessing, let them ask questions. We don't have all the answers, but boy, we can let them ask. They just feel comfortable doing that if you're being Christ-like and loving towards them. At the end, I was able to, uh, I gave him $20. I told him I'd buy Travis ice cream, so I gave him $20 to buy him dinner tonight. They were so thankful. Each one gave me a hug before they left. And boy, I'm telling you, there are hungry people like that out here. We must boldly stand for that truth because people like that are listening. Now remember, what I didn't want to do at the end is, hey, say this prayer to make sure you're saved. They did not understand repentance. They did not understand the full work of the cross yet. They were just in search mode. They each got my card. They each wanted my book. And one of the guys with the tattoos told me, he said, your book would be great for a friend of mine. I told him to email me. I'll send him two copies of it, all right? So let's not go for false comments. Let's get people really to understand their sin, really understand repentance, and really understand the cross. And we're going to get a really strong believer when that person's ready to repent and get right with Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, we're at the uh, Pride Festival here in Atlanta, GA. Let's get some names here. What's your first name? Robbie. Robbie and? Kathy. Kathy and? Tamara. Tamara. Robbie, Kathy, and Tamara. I'm going to try to remember this during the conversation. Okay. <laughs> uh, we walked up. You were sitting on a bench here. What's the relationship between everybody here, Tamara? Well, this is my mom, and I have known him since I was like two years old. He's my best friend in the world. So. Okay, so y'all been buddies ever since two years old, and about how old are you now? I'm 18. Really? Did you go, you go to school together and stuff like that? No, we just... How did we meet? Like, you were having a karate... He was like having a karate class with my sister, and we met through them. The family just sort of clicked. So. Okay, Robbie, right? So Robbie was beating up your sister, and you decided <laughs> to become friends with her. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the chick was beating you up? That actually happened to me one time. We have a picture of my sister with me on the ground with her foot on my chest and winner and still champion, and I'm hoping that does not get out anywhere, but I just told the entire video saying that that's out there now, so this is not good. Um, caught. We're caught, yeah. Uh, Robbie, notice on your shirt there the, um, the, the rainbow symbols uh, with the flag right there. What, what does that mean and what's that represent? It's just gay, gay symbol for how proud we are. Okay, and it's, and it's the, the rainbow's been used in the gay communities as a symbol of pride for what they do, okay? I also, oh, and you got the necklace too there. Uh, I also noticed, though, you got a cross with the, with the rainbow on that. What, what does that mean? It's just, just because we're gay doesn't mean we don't have a religion. I mean, you still have Christian gay people just as much as you have straight gay people. I mean, I, gay Christian. Right, that's okay. So, so what you're saying is there's, there's uh, gay Muslims or gay Hindus and gay of all different kinds, okay. So would, would you consider yourself of any particular religious faith? Um, I consider myself going along the belief of being a Christian and being more into the Celtic belief, too. Celtic belief, okay. Uh, Kathy, how about you? I'm non-denominational. Meaning non-denominational Christian or just non-denominational uh, between well, other words? basically, I believe in God. I just don't really believe in organized religion. Okay. I've heard that more bad than once. Experience, no bad experience in a church breakup. So, basically, I don't want to belong to any specific religion. Okay. So, as you were growing up, or was after you had grown up, there was a oh, church? After... After my children were born, 
Okay, and it got ugly when the church decided to split? Oh, yeah, it got, it got very ugly. What was the reason they split? Do you, I know you know. Um, maybe because of the pastor we had at the time. He caused the split in the church. And how many years ago was that? Uh, the kids were pretty small. It was probably, maybe, yeah, it was maybe 12 years ago. And would you say that still affects you to this day? Oh, yeah. Plays it, a big it definitely does. Plays a big part in how, you know, we look at, you know, like churches and everything. I mean, we're not against them. We just really don't want to get into that again. Because it was that. really, it was tough. If you felt like you were burned once in a church setting, does that make you reluctant to walk back into a setting like that? Yeah, it really does. Yeah, and I've seen other churches go through the same thing that ours went through. And it was, you know, if you're not going to believe exactly the way we do, then we don't want you here. Uh, you know, it's interesting because uh, whether it's a divorce, uh, I just met a boy this weekend, I was speaking somewhere, and his parents are about to go through a divorce, and you could see the effect on him before it even happened. I've met people that divorces affect them years down the road, but even a church split or someplace you'd love to be at and the people you love can still affect us 12 years down the road, and people sometimes don't realize the power of the enemy or the power of evil to continue to hurt a life many years down the road, and we just don't realize that. I'm a very religious family. My family's extremely religious. Christian religion? Yes, yeah, so and they, they really think we're terrible because we don't go to a specific church. And because you support me. And because we support you. Okay. And uh, Tamara, what, what beliefs do you have? Or Christian? Or? I pretty much the same as her. I believe in God, and that's, you know, my main thing. It's just, you know, if I believe in Him, that's pretty much, you know, I think I'm set for Him. Okay. I'm closer to having an actual religion than they are. And that would be the Celtic faith. Well, the, yeah, like Celtic and Christian. Okay, and are you uh, contemplating some stuff with the Druids? Pretty much. Okay. Uh, for our audience here, tell us a little bit about the Druid faith and what it believes. Well, it's kind of, okay, you know the Wicca believe, believes in the earth and the worship of the earth. Isn't there in the Wicca faith the, uh, the pentagram with the five sides on earth, wind, sun, moon? Yeah, the Celtic. The Celtic Say that again. The pentagram, it just, it's never it's upside, right? That's um, the elements, it's, uh, earth, air, fire, and water, and in the middle is spirit. In the middle of the pentagram is spirit. In the middle is right. spirit, yes. Okay, that's right, all right. And with the, the belief that I'm in, it follows along a lot of the things of Christianity, but it doesn't go into the, you know, telling stories and using fear or anything like that, because you can't take the belief that I have and use it to judge other people because a lot of problems result in Christianity belief because they sometimes miss out on the part where it says in the Bible, judge not lest ye be judged. They forget that sometimes. It's whited out of certain Bibles. Uh, um, okay, in the, uh, in the Druid or the Celtic faith, uh, when you die, what happens after death? What happens? Pretty much go to a different spiritual plane. It's just pretty much the same exact thing as the Christian belief going to heaven. It's just a peaceful place where you're always happy. You never have any reason to be sad. And also in my belief, you don't go to hell for just liking guys or a girl liking girls. You don't. It, it's not that closed-minded as other religions. Do uh, so you're saying a heavenly place? Do you also believe in a hell? Mm-hmm. Oh yes, there's there's a place of extreme torment. That's where you go when you're a horrible person. I mean, if you try your best to keep a spiritual and open-minded and everything as possible, and try to love people for who they are, you go to the spiritual plane of happiness. And then there's still a dark place that you go to if you're a bad person. Okay. And so the question I want to ask is, what separates who gets the heavenly place or who gets the place of torment? What's the separating factor? To tell you the truth, in my belief, it's the state of mind. If you really believe that what you're doing is good, then you go to the spiritual plane where you're happy all for eternity. And if you believe that you're a bad person and you believe that you belong in the place of torment, then that's where you go. Okay, so if Adolf Hitler believed in his mind that he was doing a good thing to that cleanse... spirit would be pure, not his physical body. The physical body can be dark and evil, but if the spirit is pure within, then you can go to the 
the heavenly place. Does the Druid faith believe in a uh, supreme being or a god? There have been times where they believe in different kinds of... I mean, it, it's a longer... It's a very long, drawn-out thing of what they completely believe in. They, they, well, like the more ancient Druid belief, believed in fairies and elves and stuff like that. But, I mean, nowadays, we don't see any around, so we kind of put it out of our minds about that kind of stuff. But we still believe in angelic beings walking around. It's pretty much like Christianity believes. Yeah, because my thought was, as you said, that, that uh, sometimes we can believe we're doing something right. But because of a god or a supreme being, what I believe might be right may not be right to him. Yeah, well, yeah. see, how we see God, God is love, and it's really close to the Christian belief, but the Christian belief is using God as a weapon at certain times. Not all of them, just certain specific groups, like the people that would be protesting outside the gates here right now probably are not the type of Christians that you want to go to their church because they believe that you're a bad person because you're gay, you're a bad person because of this and this and this. There are certain levels of good and bad between them. How it is with my belief, as long as you're a good person, you're fine with me. And I'm not going to judge you for what you do. That's that's all between you and God. Um, and Kathy and Tamara, would you, and what do you believe happens after we die. What do you believe? I think what it is is um, you just sort of it's your soul. I think that you know, like if you have like a dark soul, like you've done like a lot of horrible things in your life, you know that you know. I think that one really good thing could redeem you, but you know, then again, if you've just done nothing but you know, like murder and mayhem your whole life, it's pretty you know. You're gonna have a really tough time once you die, but you know if you know you're a good spirit, then I think you know you go to some place that it's just sort of relaxing. You can just you so know. Do you, you believe we actually have good deeds we can do that can redeem some of the bad we've done? I think that there is. It's like you know, it's like a like balance. Right. You know, and it'll even yourself out. That's actually uh, what Islam believes, and Islam actually believes that you have a good angel on one shoulder. By every good deed you do, a bad angel on the other, every bad deed you do, and you get flopped on a scale in front of Allah. And on Judgment Day, if it tilts towards good, you get paradise, if it tilts towards bad, you get hellfire. They actually believe it's a weighed out system yeah. on that. The Egyptians believe that too. Yeah, and I was talking with a Muslim guy the other day, and I said, Well, if you died today, would you go to paradise or hellfire? And he said, I don't know which way, only Allah would know which way it would tip. I said, well, shouldn't you like maybe stop talking to me and go do a bunch of really good deeds to make sure it tips the right way? <laughs> that, that's what he does. Well, that and that's what he, he finally said. You know, that would make a lot of sense, and it would make a lot of sense. But living that out wasn't and what he was doing. See, the, the consequences and the rewards, in my belief, is why not? just do a bunch of good deeds all your life instead of just doing whatever you want to until you feel that you're close to dying and then do a bunch of good things. I would rather just be as nice a person as I possibly can and as close to spirituality as I could so I wouldn't have to worry about the risk of, well, what's my God going to think when I go before him? I don't want to get judged. I'd rather do as many good things and if I'm going to go to the bad place, then I can actually say, hey, look, I did all these good things. Why am I going there? I've actually had people tell me when they get on their deathbed, they finally get right with God. Yeah, that's and it's kind of that same type. I've never heard of in my life. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's a noble thing, but why wait until you're dying slowly to choose the time? It's like, okay, with Christianity and suicide. Suicide is the number one thing you're going to hell. You can't redeem yourself once you're dead. That is their belief. Well, and... Huh? I don't think that... In Christianity... They tell you suicide is... No, the, you can't get into heaven because of suicide. You don't go to hell because of it. You're in purgatory. You're in between. I met a guy the other day on a plane flight, and his birthday was September 11th. Mm. Oh. And he lives in upstate New Jersey, and his, and his, um, uh, his sister-in-law works at the World Trade Center building. And she said, hey, I want you to come up today, Mike. I want to give you your birthday gift. And he said, no, no, give it to me Saturday when we all get together. She said, no, no, come up. I want to give it to you today on September 11th. He said, no, no, give it to me Saturday when we get together. He said, no, no, I want you to come up today. She said, okay. He drives up to New York City, parks his car. He walks up to the World Trade Center building. She comes down the elevator, walks outside, and hands him his gift at 8.45 in the morning. 
At 8.48, three minutes later, the first plane hits the first building. She works above the 90th floor. Every single person on her floor is what? Dead, gone, off into eternity. Every single one. There was no deathbed. There was no tomorrow. There wasn't 10 more seconds. If they weren't right with God, they are in trouble. And we were talking about that story about September 11, and now we just may not get to a deathbed. All right, it may be an instant time when we walk out of here. Disaster can happen at any given moment. Live for the day. I mean, you. Okay, how I think of life is, I live every day like I'm going to die that day. So I do as many good things as I can that day, because you never know. I mean, for all you know, I mean, a meteor could hit right now. And if you're a bad person, and you know you're a bad person, then where are you going to go? Robbie, would you consider yourself a good person? I try my best. I mean, I don't consider myself a saint. I don't consider myself a devil either. I just try my best, and that's about the best I can get. And Kathy, would you consider yourself a good person? Yeah, I think so. But I tend to feel a little different from them. I'm kind of old-fashioned. I believe that it doesn't matter how many good deeds you do or how much good things you do, you're still going to be judged on whether you believe in God. That's my name. Okay, and tomorrow would you, would you consider yourself a good person also? I really don't know. I mean, I try to be. <laughs> Mama says so. I try, to, like, I try to be, but I mean, that, like what she said, that's all up to God whether or not I am or not. You know, one of the things that hit me is I was uh, doing some searching a few years ago, and people say, well, you're a good guy, you do good things. My question is, what's the standard on being good? And so I take time to start studying uh, some different religions and stuff like that. And one of the standards I found out there in the Judeo-Christian faith was the Ten Commandments. Okay, you've heard of the Ten Commandments, all right? Uh, have you ever told a lie before? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I used to be really good at it. Okay, well, you practiced it as I did. Uh, but if you told a lie, what would that make you if you told a lie? Be a liar for the time being, but you can always redeem it. You know, it's interesting. At that moment, I was a liar when I made that statement. Okay. Have you ever stole something before? I did. Okay. Uh, one guy asked me one time, "Did you ever cheat on a test before?" And I said, "Yeah." And he said, "He said exactly what he said to me. He said you stole an answer off someone else's test." I was like, "Good point." Okay. But that made me a thief at that moment when I stole that answer. Um, another guy said to me, he "said Were you ever at work?" and you were supposed to be working and you weren't working. Stealing time. I said, yeah, he said you were stealing time from that employer. Saying you were... I was like, conviction, man, he was just killing me. But I but I was a thief at that moment. Um, have you ever lusted in your heart before? Oh, of course. All day. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks for honesty. I had some guy tell me no today, but, you know. I think that's a kind of a Thank you. Say that again, Kathy. But he was a liar at that point. I think that, that proves you're a liar. That's exactly right. <laughs> but this is what got me, uh, Jesus said, even if you look upon someone with lust, it's the same as committing adultery, because he's checking your insides as well as your outside. I was like, this is a tough standard, all right? Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? No, I try not to. <laughs> I did twice. And sometimes but I take forgiveness right after. Sometimes we, uh, it's a JC or GD we throw out there, or flippantly using God, oh my God, sometimes, and just flippantly using the holy, righteous name of God is blasphemy when we do that. Uh, you ever been angry with someone before? Oh, yeah. 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 I've been a good time of my life despising everybody, and that was before I found the right way. I mean, I will admit I was a horrible person a good time ago, but I got over it. And, and Jesus even said, even if you've been angry with someone without cause, it's the same as committing murder because he's checking our thoughts as well as our actions, our insides as well as our outsides. You would actually consider killing them if you actually hated them bad enough. I've done prison ministry work before and met murderers, and they were angry first before they killed that person oh, yeah. over a dice game, a wife, something like that. Because that, that inner rage can cause us to do things out there. But the other thing I think God is saying is that because we're made in the image of God, that makes everybody so valuable. I do not have the right in an unrighteous way to be angry towards somebody. But looking at that standard, you just told me that you'd be a liar, a thief, an adulterer, and a murderer by that standard. So would you be guilty or not guilty on Judgment Day by that standard? I would be guilty. Now you think about it. You'd be guilty of it. Everybody is at some point in their life, I think. I want you to hold that thought, because that's exactly what I was going Because what you just said is when you begin to think about it, you're exactly right. I'd be guilty by that standard. How about you, Rob? Probably. 
And my question is, would that mean heaven or would that mean hell if we were guilty by that standard? If it was by that standard, then, you know, if we're all those things, I think we would end up really in a hell. I didn't understand. If, if we were guilty by the standard of the Ten Commandments, uh, would that mean heaven or would that mean hell on judgment? I think that would mean hell if you hadn't asked forgiveness for it. But if you've asked for forgiveness for it, it doesn't, I mean, it cancels it out. Slate's quite clean. That's why we have a God that loves everything. All right. And if it would mean hell, does that bother you that you'd be going to hell? Does it bother you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a creepy thought. I said, oh, yeah. From the world. That's a, that's a very scary thought. You know, that's an interesting question to ask at that point because if God has a standard, and it would mean I'd be guilty, and it would mean I'd going to hell. It ought to bother the dickens out of me that I'd be going anywhere near that place, okay? And so... Even if I slip up on something, it's like, you know, oh, Lord, please forgive me for that. Uh, I didn't mean it. <laughs> and what hit me was exactly tomorrow what you said, was that six billion of us would be guilty by that standard. When you go to Ten Commandments, we've all lusted to be angry. I don't care if you go to China, Europe, or America, we'd all be guilty by that standard. But which worships any kind of God. If they believe in any kind of forgiveness, I mean, all you have to do is ask for forgiveness right afterwards, and you don't have to worry about it. See, when you study, it, oh yeah, definitely. You can't, you can't just ask for forgiveness. Oh, you got to yeah. mean it. Oh yeah. All right. So God would know the intentions of your heart, whether you're just yeah. flippantly saying, uh -huh. "I need forgiveness." Oh, or I'm it's not the same. It's but like, you know. oh yeah, give me forgiveness, Lord, because I don't want to go to hell. That's not exactly going to work. Be like, I really feel bad about doing that, so please forgive me. Then it's meaningful and it'll work. And since it would mean six billion of us would be going to hell, what hit me was, we're all going there unless God provided a way out. Exactly. Alright, now, do you know what that way out would be? Okay, forgiveness. And how would, uh, and how would we actually get that forgiveness? I think you just have to ask Him, you know, yeah, yeah, so you gotta mean it that, you know, just like to forgive him, that ask, that ask him to forgive you, sorry. Um, and uh, you just try, like, you know, to be a better, you know, at whatever. Just ask it and really mean it. So try not to do those deeds again yeah. after that. One thing that hit me was when I was studying different religions was that in the Judeo Christian faith, um, we can ask for forgiveness, but it costs God a very, very heavy, heavy penalty. Uh, for this man's sins, and what did it cost him? Death of his son. The death of his son. Uh, the death of his son. And when you go back, and sometimes somebody wants to be flippantly and say, "God, would you forgive me for this?" But we forget. Uh, did you see the movie The Passion? Yeah, I saw that movie. Yeah. Bobby, you didn't see it. I do, but how you need to see it. Uh, what What was your What was your take on it when you saw it? The hardest movie I'd ever sat through. But I made myself sit through it because I figured he went through it. That's what? The very least I could do was sit through the movie and see what he went through. So, in some sense, you wanted to walk out when you saw the torture and stuff like that. But you said just because you knew he went through that for the sin of the world that you felt like you could go through the two-hour movie to make sure and watch that. Exactly. I just hardest movie I've ever sat through, but I'm really glad I did. Um, and has it affected you in any way since you have seen that movie, positive or negative? Well, it made me think a lot more. The movie was brutally honest. I don't think a lot of people said, well, you know, it was just they went too far, and but I don't think they did. Um, I don't think there was a way to really portray exactly what he went through, and that was the best that they could come up with. And I think they were just brutally honest in it, and. It really makes me think a lot now if there's something that I'm wanting to do and I think, well, you know, how would he feel if I did this? How would that make him feel? You know, if you truly study uh, crucifixion and, um, and the scourging, the movie was probably about one one hundredth of what he really went through. I mean, really, it was much, much worse than that. And they can't do that. Tomorrow, how did the, the movie affect you? It was... It was definitely... Hold on one second. Robbie, what'd you say? People wouldn't be able to watch it if they saw what really happened to him. I mean, he had people spitting on him. He had people cursing him. He had people throwing fruit at him and different things. He got lashed with whips. He got nails straight through him. I mean, he got a crown of thorns. 
and they couldn't take the time of showing how long he was up on that cross. I mean, it took a while for him to finally die. And, I mean, anybody who actually filmed that, you would almost have to do that, actually do that to a person for it to look as real as it was, and you couldn't do it. I mean, no one would be willing to go through that kind of pain and yeah, torture. You have to and figure that it was really worse than what they showed. Yeah. Exactly. And it, and it just amazes me sometimes how I can be flippant about my sin, but knowing that's what it cost him. The thing that, that really bothers me is the people that see that movie and they see what he went through, they can still go and start doing exactly what God forbids. See, the number one thing that I am against with certain, see, I have a column A and a column B for Christianity. The column A are the people who judge nonstop, tell you exactly why you're going to hell, and they think that just because they go to church on Sunday or they go to their priest and get forgiveness and say the Hail Marys and everything, that they're going to be fine, but they can still go home and beat the crap out of their wife, rape their kids, and drink all the time. The problem with that is, okay, the column A Christians are that. Column B Christians are the people that can come here look around at all the people and say, I'm so happy that these people feel comfortable here. You know, they don't judge you. They don't go against anything that you are. They accept you because you are a child of God, no matter what you do. It's not your place to judge that person. It's, it's not your place to do anything. It's God's place. You know, it's interesting when you study the Bible, it, it, it says that we're all made in the image of God, but it says in the book of John that only those who receive Jesus Christ actually become a child of God. Yeah. So not everybody walking planet Earth, according to the Bible, is a child of God. It's those who receive Jesus yeah, Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. How people believe when they become a child of God, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with getting saved or whatever religion calls it. Whatever religion you're in, whatever they call it, when you become a child of God, there are a lot of responsibilities. You can't be, you know, so judgmental and everything if you've been saved or you've been born again, or whatever religion you're in, what they call it, you can't go and start telling people left and right that they're going to hell just because you believe you are a child of God and you don't believe they are. It's not your place, and you should know it. If you're going to get saved and you actually feel the power that comes with that, you should understand the responsibility before you start casting judgment at all. Um, let me ask you a question. Uh, if you walk past a pool, with uh, and you saw a young kid drowning in the pool. Okay, would you jump? Would you jump in there and save that child? Of course. Yes. Yes, I that's think, how my does. My worst enemy is Matter of fact, uh, we wouldn't even take time to put on a bathing suit. No. We would dive in that pool and get that child out of there. I do it for anybody. The Bible being true, and if, if someone becomes born again and saved and knows that to be true, means not only there's a heaven, there's also a hell. And because there is a hell that people actually go to. A true Christian should want to run to those people to give them the truth so they can make a decision off the truth. Now, hold on a second. The key, though, is how do you give them the truth? And in the Bible says to speak the truth in love. It doesn't mean to take it and shove it down someone's throat, but it means to present the information out for somebody so they can take and make a decision off that information. Just like if you buy a car or a house, you'll go study to see about the right information. If this is the car you want, what's your warranty, what's your insurance, insurance going to be, because you have to look at the information to make a good decision. Eternally, it's the same way. you got to present the information to people so they can make a good decision off the information that's there. You also have to be really careful when you're telling people the truth. Tell them what religion you are and how strongly you believe in that religion, but try your best not to make it judgmental or you're going to end up having the, the person really mad at you because they're going to feel like you're judging them. And the more they feel like you're judging them, of course, they're going to go against it even more. So you're driving them away if you really think about it. You're driving that person away. Okay, say you got a Christian person and they're trying to tell an atheist that there is a God and that they believe in God and they feel happy about it. If they're judgmental, that person's going to be even more strongly in their belief that there isn't a God because why would God send one of his children to scream and yell at me and tell me I'm going to hell because I don't believe in him? God's supposed to be love. He's not supposed to be hatred and judgment. A guy told me one day that there are 21 God is in the Bible. God is fair. God is righteous. God is love. 
But there's another one. God is wrathful. There's a wrathful side to God. He hates sin so much. And when you study the Old Testament, they used to go to the temple. Like, when you when you go to the temple, you put the, the lamb on the altar, and you would put your hands on the lamb. And by faith, your sin would transfer. And then by and then they cut the throat, the shedding of the blood, your sin was remissed on there. And I asked a Jewish guy the other day, do you still uh, sacrifice animals for your sin? He said, well, well no, the temple's not up. And then I explained to him about uh, the prophecies in the Old Testament, how Yeshua, Jesus, equaled those prophecies. And then I told him about how Jesus was the perfect sacrifice once and for all sin, and that it was no longer an animal uh, sacrifice, but it was the sacrifice of the Son of Almighty God. And truly what happened on that day was not just a forgiveness for you and I on this end of the cross, but what it also did was satisfy the wrathful side of God, because God has to judge sin. He hates it. He's pure and holy and righteous, and I'm not even close. But he has to judge that sin. And so it was on this end I was getting the forgiveness, but on this end it was God throwing his wrath upon his son to judge all of that sin. All right? And one thing I always told my students, a simple model, one I, li I live by a few models, the one is if the truth hurts, it's still the truth. If I graded your test and you got a 67 or a bunch of red X's on there, you didn't study for my test. Okay? I'm not going to go change the score just because you didn't study. Sometimes the truth hurts. You know, it's honest, though. Um, you can't judge, you say, but yet you've sat there and told me a liar, a thief, an adulterer, a blasphemer, a murderer by God's standard. Because our conscience, God gave us a conscience in the heart to know right from wrong. And we know we need to live by His standard. But if I don't, and none of us have, in His lovingness, you keep talking about the love, love side of God, that He has present, uh, uh, given me a way out. But I have to want to repent of that sin, that turn from, change of mind is what it means, a literal mind change, all right? But then when I put it underneath the blood of Jesus Christ, it's like the, God says, the Bible says that the blood will cleanse you of all your sin, wash you clean of all your sin. That's the mercy. That is the mercy and the grace of God that we don't deserve, but He has presented to us if you want it. And see, a simple word picture I read from a guy one day, and he... Um, Let's just say I was going to give you this pad of paper, okay? But it's still my pad of paper until you do what? And once you take it, it becomes your pad of paper, all right? Same thing. What Jesus did still sits up on that cross. It is still sitting there for six billion people if you want it. But at some point, I have to take it, apply it to my life, and be washed clean of all that sin. Watch this. It's like this. If you bought those cool pants, check that out. Um, I was going to say the department store, but they don't sell stuff like that. Um, but if you bought those at a store and they left the security tag on the pocket, what would have happened when you came walking out of the store? The alarm would have gone off. All right, the alarm goes off. Word picture, a gate to heaven the same way. There's like two sensors on it. When you go walking out into heaven, you go walking through those gates with the two sensors on it, only one thing would set the alarm off. It'd be all your what? Sin. All your sins. But if you've been cleansed of all that sin, can you walk through that gate when you walk out of here? Yes. Oh, uh, I can show you 50 to 100 verses in the Bible. Once you've repented of your sin, put it underneath the blood of Jesus Christ, you are cleansed and clean and ready to go towards heaven. All right? And then God's in the business of molding and shaping you into the person that he wants you to be as you walk out of here and go there. All right? And my question is, has there ever been a point that you've repented of your sin and put it underneath the blood of Jesus Christ? Do you know the time that you've actually done that? Yeah, I think so. I can't remember exactly, but I know that it was like I've done, I've done something or I've said something, and then it's just like you know, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. And then you just like you know, please, please forgive me. And then, you know, if you seriously ask for honest forgiveness, I think that it goes. It's a term in the Bible, uh, born again, and what it means is there's got to be a point in your life where you're choosing to repent, run away from the things of this world, and run towards God. And that's what the term means. I heard the term as a kid. I wasn't a Christian, but I heard the term born again. I was like, what does it mean? And it means a commitment and a surrender to Jesus Christ to do that for the forgiveness of my sins. Okay, so do you know if there's been a point you've done that? Yeah, there's points where I've done that. Uh, Kathy, how about you? And what did you ask? At the time you've been born again, you know that you've given your life, surrendered it to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Robbie? I did when I was 12 years old. Okay. And now my question is, since all of you gave an affirmative to that, is your belief and faith in Jesus Christ today as strong as it was when you made a commitment to it back in the day? No, my faith has gotten 10 times stronger than it was, even 100 times if, if you count you know, 
all the stuff that happened between when I got saved and where I am now because I went through well there's the part in the Bible where it talks about all Christians go through trials and tribulations I went through so many horrible things that brought me down and the only thing that I had with me to keep me from committing suicide was holding on to faith and I had a very small shred of faith but I held on to it as hard as I could it's like your favorite thing in the world that makes you feel like you're a normal person you want to hold on to that as long as possible and if it ever gets taken away you might as well just die that was the one thing that I was holding on to Bobby, how old were you? you told me you were 18? 12 no I'm sorry, 12 and you're, you're 21 now uh, nine years ago, was it in a church setting? that you guys say? I was sitting at home and I was having a really rough time um, with school and stuff. I got picked on all the time. I was a runt. So I, I felt awful all the time. So I figured, you know what? Why not try it? And I'm not going to do it in a church because all I see in any church that I've been in, because I'm not exactly the person that people want to be around when I go into a Baptist church or something, because there's a lot of people that don't like me. And how I believe it, God likes me, so that's it. So I'm at home. I asked him to come to my heart. I felt it almost knock me in the floor. It was such a strong feeling. And that that moment right there is what caused me to be able to hold on to it, just slightly hold on to it through all that pain. And then when I finally got out of it, I've been on cloud nine, so to speak, since I got over all the stuff because now my faith has been able to get stronger and stronger because I don't have the hate, I don't have the rage, I don't feel the pain and depression that I felt during that time of trial and tribulation. Um, and all three, three of you believe hell is a real place, right? And do you believe it's a responsibility of someone who claims the name of Jesus Christ to make sure they boldly share their faith in Jesus Christ, talking about sin, repentance, and the cross with people to make sure people in your life do not go to hell? Yeah, I mean, you know, you kind of feel like, you, you know, it's like, well, you know, if I believe in God, I need to let people know. You can't say that you're a Christian and act ashamed of it. You know, if someone asks you, and you know, if you believe you are, you can't say, oh, no, I'm not, just because, you know, they think that they'll make fun of you or because, you know, They'll be like, oh, well, you must be this little goody-goody. It's not true. I mean, you can't be ashamed of your Christianity. So you have to go out there and you have to let people know, I think. Yeah, yeah I believe you have, you have to let people know. But like you said, you can't cram it down their throat because it's going to make them fight back that much harder. You can present them with what you feel are the facts, what you believe are the facts, and then they have to make their own decision, just like I had to make my decision. How I, feel about, how, how I feel about it, okay, how we're talking right now, you talk to them about it, you don't preach at them, you can preach to them and tell them how wonderful you feel because of it, I mean, it's the same if, if you're talking to a person that's been on drugs, you know, you tell them that you've been on drugs before and you know what path they're going to go down if they choose to stay on drugs, then that might help them not be on drugs anymore but if you tell them that they're morons for being on drugs or something like that they're just going to want to not listen to you so stay off your soapbox if you're going to talk to somebody about religion tell them the good things about it don't tell them the negative things because that's going to make them feel like well why do i want to be believing in a god that's going to send me to hell you tell them well you'll go to heaven for this and you'll feel good in your heart for this and he can help you through this Bobby, do you remember back in school when um uh, they used to have a police officer come to our schools and teach us about drunk driving, all right? And one of the things they would do, they'd get on the board and they start listing all the problems if you drink and drive. You can lose your license. You can get in a car accident. Your insurance can go through the roof. Uh, you can kill yourself. You can kill someone else. You can be in the hospital, maim yourself. They listed all the consequences, so hopefully you would not what? You wouldn't drink and drive. You wouldn't drink and drive, all right? Because that, that's actually a beautiful thing to let people know what the consequences are coming up. But they're now, also not saying that, drunk, that, that drinking is stupid. They don't say that if you pick up a beer and have a drink with your friends that you're a moron for it. They're not going to Well, and watch. Because one of the beautiful things when I started reading the Bible was it's, it talks about hell twice as much about heaven. 
And I thought, well, wait, is that condemning that Jesus does that or that the Bible does? Well, what it was is God so loved the world. He so loves each one of us that I have to tell you the consequence that's going to come to make sure you run nowhere near that when you walk on it. So actually, it's the loving thing to do. The real issue, though, is how you do it. Jesus sat down and talked with the woman for well. I speak at Christian events around the country. One thing I tell them is a lot of the homosexuals don't like Christians. And the reason they really don't like them is not because they're a Christian. It's because they, they talk down to them and treat them like the scum of the earth. And I tell people all the time, when you learn to talk eye to eye with people, man to man, and just sit down on a bench and chat with people, people chat with you all day long, all right? But the issue is how you do that. And once people realize that everybody is made in the image of Almighty God, you'd want to see the best for that person, not the worst for that person. And so that's one of the things. You have to speak the truth, but you have to do it in such a loving way that people will chat with you and do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because the reason I tell you that hell is so real, have you heard of uh, Charles Barkley, the basketball player? Uh, Charles Barkley, the basketball player, uh, we used to be roommates together at uh, Auburn University. We, we used to room together on road trips and stuff all the time. So I played basketball way back in the day. And this is a true story. His younger brother had a heart attack and died, all right? But he came back. Have you heard about uh, near-death experiences, white lights and tunnels people see? You've had times you've actually flatlined before on, a, on an operating table? No, I wasn't on an operating table. I just, um, I was, what happened to me, I tried to kill myself one time. I, okay, and how did you try to do it? I took about 18 sleeping pills when you're only supposed to take one. If you took more than one, you'd forget to breathe when you fell asleep. I took 18 of them with a bottle of vodka because of churches, my parents being against me for being gay and everything. And to, to tell you the honest truth, people don't want to realize the fact that we don't choose to be the way that we are. We just can't help it. I mean, it's not a thing of lust necessarily. I mean, there are bad apples of gay people that totally go into the stereotype, but people like me, I just happen to like guys. It's not because I lust for them or anything. I mean, anybody who says they have never lusted is just totally blowing hot air. Because, I mean, everybody feels it. That's why God put other people on this earth. I mean, but the thing is, I was getting judged left and right by everybody just for that reason. So I tried to end my life because I figured, well, people are hating me right now anyway, so why not end their hatred? Why not solve their problem because I seem to be causing them so many problems because I'm just alive? So I tried to kill myself. And I ended so, up. So, what happened when you took the vodka? Well, when I tried to do it, I fell asleep. And when I was asleep, I felt really tingly. It was like a, a dreamless sleep. And I could feel something pulling me. It felt like something was pulling me off into the air. But the thing was, I mean, I, I didn't feel like, like I didn't look down at myself and see myself floating away, you know, from myself. I just felt like something was pulling me out from where I was. I felt you, really light. Like you exited your body? Yeah, it, it felt like I was really light. Did you see anything when you exited your body? No, I just, I saw a little bit of a light above me. Like I was, it's like, okay, you know when you go out of a tunnel and the light is behind where you're at, but you can still kind of see the light right. above you? I saw that kind of thing and then by that time I was already coming back. Um, so I was never gone for that long. Uh, that's interesting because I, I was going to tell you that uh, Charles Barkley, the basketball player, his younger brother had a, a heart attack and died. Uh, he flatlined and died, but he came back. And this is what he saw. He told me when he rose up out of his body, he could see the flatline on the table, okay? And he went towards the waiting room. He could tell you who was in the waiting room, what they were saying, what they were wearing, while he was clinically flatlined, all right? So this can't just be in his head. This has to be an external event. Watch what happened. He took off on a journey, all of a sudden he saw trees on fire, ground smoldering around the trees. He saw a lake of fire in front of him when he died. I said, Daryl, what'd you see, dude? He said, I saw hell. I said, dude, you saw hell. He'll tell you to this day what he saw is more real than this park is right here. He said, your senses work to the nth degree. He said, you could feel the heat coming off that lake of fire. It was so intense. So that's exactly what the Bible says people will go to without a relationship with, with Jesus Christ being forgiven of all their sins. And if I know that, 
I got to make sure that this man goes nowhere near that when I die. But I have also got to make sure that I am warning every single person as we walk through life. The, the Bible says that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It is not a good day when someone goes to hell today. And if I have that information, I've got to do something about that. God doesn't hate the sinner. God hates the sin. He's against the sin. That's why he didn't kill Satan, because we have to have our free will. He does not hate you because you're a sinner. He hates what sin is in you. And do you believe you can trust the Bible when it talks about what sin is and what sin isn't? I think it goes further into what do you believe sin is. Like, okay. well, wait a minute. If, if, if there's a guy, just like when I taught school, uh, I got to set the standard for the classroom. There were 30 of them. There were a bunch more than me. But because I had the power as a teacher, I got to set the standard for the classroom. Okay? Because there is a God, wouldn't he get to set the standard for the universe? Yeah, definitely. Do y'all think that too? Yeah. I think it also Bible's, you know, a guidebook. It tells you what will happen if you don't live the kind of life God wants you to. Right. And what will happen if you do. Uh, Robbie, you, you said earlier in the conversation that you were living in the gay lifestyle, all right? There are 12 or 13 verses in the Bible that say that homosexual sin is, is wrong, is sinful to God, okay? So how do you rectify those two together as you think about that? Well, um, all sins are exactly the same in God's eyes. It's sin, no matter what you do. Murdering someone is about the same as stealing a, bar, a candy bar from a store. It's all bad and it's punishable. And there aren't any like warnings. There's no, it's not like our legal system. Like you murder someone, you get two consecutive life sentences. You steal a candy bar, you get a, a fine or something like that. It's not like that. God doesn't do things that way. That you either are a sinner or you're not a sinner. And how it is with me, I mean, I've seen one thing in the Bible that was talking about homosexuality and it said do not lie down with mankind as you would with womankind because it's detestable and I took that as God thinks it's gross it also says it's a shame for a man to have long hair there's plenty of guys who have long hair it doesn't say it's a sin it says it's detestable it says it's shameful it's something bad would you want to do something that's shameful to God in the eyes of Almighty God? No, but like I said before, I mean, we're not, we don't just wake up one morning and say, hey, I want to stop liking girls or I want to stop liking guys and I just want to like the opposite. If you could be straight instead of gay, would you want to? Well, technically, yeah, because, I mean, that would make it where my family wasn't against it. It would make it where churches didn't talk, talk down to me, Christians wouldn't talk down to me, and I would have a lot more people that wouldn't be calling me names and stuff all the time because that's all I hear. Um, how, how's your relationship with your father? Um, it used to be really rough because my dad is very much what you would consider a Christian redneck. He believes in the Bible very, very uh, devotingly, and he's a redneck. So, I mean, having a gay son is not exactly what he was asking for in church, you know? So, I mean, we had our times where we were really rough around the edges, but, I mean, now he's starting to understand that this is not something that I decided on. I'm just trying to find love from wherever I can get it, pretty much. Um, was, he a, uh, was he a hugging father? Would he be a love on you type father? Anything like that? I know what part you're getting to on this one, because a lot of people think that if you have an absentee father or a father that doesn't pay enough attention to you that you turn out being gay. It wasn't because I was really close with my mom and far from my dad. It was just the fact that I just, for some odd reason, didn't like being going out with the girls. I would rather be friends with the girls. I'd rather play house than play army and stuff like that. I mean, starting at a young age. Yeah, starting at a very young age. I mean, do you, do you know when the thoughts of me with guys actually began? Can you do you know when that happened? When I was eight years old, I saw I, I was friends with a few guys and I was friends with a lot of girls, and I realized that. I wanted to be friends with the girls and the guys I wanted to, for some odd reason, I wanted to like 
hang out with them more because I thought they were cute. Like certain things about them made me feel the way that the other guys were feeling about the girls that I was friends with. And I realized that I didn't have that kind of attraction to girls. And then as I grew older, I started understanding more of what that feeling was. And it was the fact that I liked them. I, I was wanting to be friends with the girls, but I wanted to actually start a relationship with guys. See, with me, it's not about sex. That's the part where homosexuality is a bad thing to me. I mean, how I and it's just about sleeping with a lot of people or something like that. Look at it. If you look at it this way, being a whore in the Bible, being a whore is, I mean, to them, you stone them, you just throw stones at them. But it's like Jesus said when he was defending Mary Magdalene, let he who has no sin cast the first stone. I mean, how it is with me, I believe that if you're not just after the same sex just because you want to have sex with that person and just because you want to use them for to fulfill your lustful thoughts and do all that kind of stuff, I think that's when it's really bad. But if you just want a relationship with someone, see, I, I'm old-fashioned in the way of I want to go on dates, I want to cuddle, I want to hug that person, I want to hold hands with that person and stuff. It's not, I, I don't go after guys because I want to have sex. And, and again, back to what I just said though, but was your dad a cuddler and a hugger and a, a toucher like that? No, not really, but I mean, we had emotional attachments. I mean, it wasn't like he stayed away from me or anything, or my mom was like really close to me. I had a, a fairly equal relationship with both my parents. I mean, do you think it is possible that you could be missing that loving, positive touch of your father that you never got? No, because I mean, he was there for me when I needed to have my dad around. He was always there. I usually went to my mom because I mean, everybody goes to the mom because everybody knows that the mom is usually. Now, this is going by a stereotype of the difference between a mom and a dad, but the dad's usually there for having fun. The mom's there to talk to. The dad you go hunting and fishing with, or you bond with your dad. Your mom, you don't bond with your mom unless you're a girl. Because you want to go and learn how to cook, you want to learn how to stuff. One second. Have y'all bonded? Oh, we bond all the time. Okay, I want to make y'all are bonding. Okay, all right. I'm really close to her dad. I'm very close to my dad. And is, is mom and dad still together? Oh, yeah. Okay. 20, what, 20, 21, years. Yeah, 21 years. 21 year anniversary? Uh, in January. So we're married 20 years. Fantastic. Uh, don't let anything separate that as the days come. And uh, <laughs> I just I just saw a card at a family, and it was a 30 year anniversary, and the, and the husband wrote, uh, Honey, I hope there's 30 more to come. I just said, What a neat thing to say. Um, again, you don't have to answer this, but I just want to ask a question. Um, were, were you ever molested as a kid? No. Um, I was, I had someone attempt to rape me later on in life, but it wasn't when I was a kid. It was after I was already like, when was it? Like 17 or 18? You were, you were on up in age whenever that no, happened. Like 16 or 17, I think. Someone tried to molest me, but I took care of that because that was when I was a really bad person. And was that a male that did that? Um, yeah, but I had already had boyfriends before then so that, that didn't really have much to do with it but I have dealt with the trauma of it so when you were wrong, he was gay by the time he was like seven or eight years yeah. old like I said I've known him since he was like five years old and you could just tell you know the way there was a difference about it uh, yeah there was something different and you could also tell he fought it I mean he fought it for a long time I tried so hard I but, hated um, about it the reason we're here today with him is, you know, we can't turn our back on him and just quit loving him. Because, you know, he's like a son. I have two daughters. He's my son. Um, that's me. Thanks for loving him like that. And that's, um, I think too many times we just push people away in life instead of uh, trying to love them. And um, I, again, you don't have to answer this one either. Um, I love my <laughs> Well, I, I'm asking this for a certain reason. I'm not trying to pry. Um, what age was your first sexual experience with a guy, if you, if you know, if you want to say it? You mean like all the way or just some kind of anything sexual? Some kind of touch or anything along the way. Okay, um, I'd say I was about eight. Eight years old. Eight years old. The first time I 
did anything at all. And it wasn't like... But you did? Yeah. Oh, okay. That so we were doing, that me and the other person were doing. And how old was the other person? Um, God, I think he was like 10, maybe. So the person was a couple years older? Yeah. A, a neighborhood friend? Yeah, guy in the neighborhood. I mean, it was... We were just talking and stuff like that. I mean, it, it, it kind of goes into pretty much what happens when anybody gets curious about it. They want to try it, but they kind of are reluctant to do anything. I mean, it wasn't really a big thing. It's not like, you know, we had full on, you know, whatever you want to call it. I don't want to make it sound trashy. That's okay. And the reason I'm asking is because uh, there's a lot of studies out there that say, and you mentioned earlier, a non-existent father that didn't hug and touch a kid can help. The molestation is huge. I cannot tell you how many people I've met that in the gay community that have been molested. And the, the other one is, I, I met a guy at Music Midtown, and he told me that he had... I'm like, what is flying around? We got a plane with a banner. <laughs> um, and it wasn't any clips. We all looked up for a second. Um, but uh, maybe the sky was cracking and the Lord was coming back. And that's what it was. Um, but I met a guy at Music Midtown. He, was, he had his first sexual experience at 12 years old. And I said, well, who was it? It was a 16-year-old. Um, in the neighborhood, and he told me, he looked me dead square in the eye and said, and from that day on, I've had thoughts to be with other guys. And so what they're finding out is there seems to be conditional things that happen in our world that can help with what they call gender confusion as we're growing up and we're growing up and we're learning to be a boy or be a girl that things can confuse our mind through that. I wasn't really confused. I mean, I was, I was seeing that I was attracted. I mean, I was, I hated everything about it. I mean, just that first experience freaked me out really bad too. I mean, I was already feeling the feelings and I was talking to him about it and he had been feeling the same thing. So we were going to like try something. We just, we kissed and we saw each other. That was about it. I mean, we didn't Because the reason, the reason I want to just bring this up is we'll close it in just a second. Um, is uh, you've heard of the Centers for Disease Control yeah. here in Atlanta. And yeah. why do you say, oh yeah? Oh, because I have a sister-in-law that works for them. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, the Centers for Disease Control, and again, what they do is they study infectious disease and all this stuff, but rec make recommendations, all right? The Centers for Disease Control has come out and said the number one way, if somebody wants HIV or AIDS, there's one particular act that if you want it, that this act will give you a much higher rate to get it than anything else you could possibly ever do on planet Earth. But do you know by any chance what that act is? Sex? It's, it's not drug use, it's not blood transfusions, it's male-to-male -male anal sex unprotected, okay? And that is the most dangerous thing you could possibly do. I'm safer than a nurse in a hospice when it comes to sex. And what's interesting uh, is, and again, I don't know it about age, but they're now finding out with most diseases, most sexually transmitted diseases, it has nothing to do with transmission of fluids. Skin-to-skin -skin contact can pass the diseases now they're finding out. All right. It just depends on what disease it is. I mean, I, I did a lot of research on AIDS when I finally decided, you know, I'm tired of fighting this and I'm just going to tell people. I, I pretty much realized it when I was eight years old. I waited ten years before I finally told anybody, and they were the first ones I told, and they were like, well, it's about time. So, I mean, because y'all realized that y'all knew to a point. Oh, thank you. Yeah. We knew he had a rough life ahead of him. He'd gone through so much. And he just seemed more relaxed. Whenever he finally he came, out. He came out. He yeah, that. it's like, you know, it was a huge load off of him. And, you know, it's like, okay, you know, we can accept you and still love you no matter how you are. And, you know, he just seemed so much more relaxed once, you know, he said, okay, I, I just don't want to fight it anymore. Uh, I, I, someone told me to try this, and I tried this the other day. They said, take the words homosexual life expectancy and put them into Google and hit enter. All right? And I tried that. Do you know what pops up when that happens? Do you know? Study after study after study all around the world that the average homosexual loses 20 to 30 years off their lifespan compared to a heterosexual. That literally... 
Uh, because of what you think? Probably because of stress. I was actually talking with a lesbian the other day up in New York, and she told me, she said, oh, that's easy to figure out why. I said, well, why is that? She said, because of the high suicide rate in the gay community. Exactly. Okay, there's, very, there's, very high. There's a few things um, that homosexuals go through a lot worse than heterosexual people. Um, it's mainly because of the gay bashing, the, the hate crimes, and stuff like that. I mean, we smoke. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Okay. And what's interesting was some of the studies were done in very gay friendly communities. The Netherlands, very open gay lifestyle, gay marriage, everything. They don't have the problem. Oh, guess what? The same groups of people were dying still 20 or 30 years younger. There was no different in life expectancy. Get that on his, did you get his face on that one? His jaw just dropped. Because see, our expectation is that if, if uh, we go into a more friendly, less stressful place, but what they're finding, you just said a lot of smoking in the community. Oh yeah, I mean, we, okay. Smoke is a big kind of stress reliever. I smoke myself, I've been trying to quit for a while, but it's, it's kind of difficult. I mean, I live in Loganville, and there's a lot of people with big trucks and rebel flags all over the place, and that's a stressed out environment because you never know when someone's going to scream out the window, bag it, or something like that. So we smoke more. This is me talking about me and my friends that are gay. We smoke more. We drink more. We're more likely to commit suicide. We're more likely to be satanic uh, in belief. We're more likely to be satanic in belief? Oh, yeah, definitely. You know some gay people that are into the Satanism? Um, I wasn't into Satanism. I was into the dark arts, and I was like, I had just become a warlock when I finally decided, look, I want to be on the godly path, so I'm getting out of this really quick because I was kind of messed up. And you know when you deal with uh, warlocks or Satanism, you deal with demons, you know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, was really I, scared I had everybody when he went into that. I went into hiding for a while because they couldn't handle what I was going through. I mean, I was addicted to drugs. I was in the dark arts. Um, I disappeared for a while off the map. Nobody could look me up. And then I finally just show back up and everybody acts like it's Christmas. But, I mean, I went through a lot of stuff because of all the stress and all the hatred and everything because it was like every time someone would feel hatred towards me, you would think you could go to your parents because the bully that's picking on you at school, you know, you go to mommy and daddy, they come to school and they straighten it out. I had teachers that hated me because of the fact that I was gay and I, once I finally came out, I was extremely outspoken about it because I felt so good about letting it be known that I was. I wanted people in my school, because now that I came out at my school, which was Loganville High School, a lot of people came out after me because they were scared to death before I came out to let anybody know that they even thought about the same sex. I mean, they were horrified because there were so many you know, extreme Christians that felt that they were holier than anybody because they carried around the Bible and went to church on Sunday, that they could tell them that they were going straight to hell, caused more problems because they would tell everybody else, and then you had to deal with the rednecks, you had to deal with all the other people, you know, condemning you because you felt this way, and it, it's not necessarily your fault. I mean, it's like you said, you don't have the love of your father, or you have a lot of love from your mother, or you get molested, or something like that. There are different reasons that we're gay, and you can't attack a person for being that way because they can't necessarily help it. Because if there's been societal factors that have caused them to go down that road, what I have found with most gay men that I chat with is their heart is broken. It's been broken by some events down the road, and so instead of condemning those people, why don't someone want to bring them the love of Almighty God the truth of Almighty God is God can mold through the pain that's, that's been there. Now you, uh, you know when you deal with warlocks and you deal with uh, the dark side like that, you deal with demons, you know that. Oh yeah, I came really close to seeing it. Um, remember I said before when we were talking about the out-of-body experiences or the really, you know, emotional uh, out-of-body, you know, things. I had two of them. One was committing suicide, trying to commit suicide, <laughs> attempting suicide, I guess you could say. And the other one was, I was asleep one night. I told God I was very hateful with him. This was right before I got out of the dark arts. 
I was extremely rude against him, and I was swearing at him, throwing out so many obscenities because I hated who I was. I hated existing. I didn't know why he wouldn't let me just die or anything, you know? And then that night, I fell asleep after I was like crying and talking to him, and I just finally got so exhausted. I did it for six hours straight, and I finally got so exhausted that I had to You did what for six hours straight? I talked to God. I mean, I was. I was angry and I was apologetic, you know, trying to, you know, not get him too angry where he, you know, takes me right then before I get to say what I needed to say. Because, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know if I was going to make him mad where he just strike me dead. Because, I mean, I was in that kind of dark stuff, you know, that I didn't want to you know, tempt him too bad, you know. But I wanted to find out answers. So I was like, okay, right before I passed out, I said, just give me a sign of what... I, what path I'm going on or why I need to come back to you because if I'm going to go through all this crap that I'm going through with everybody hating me and everybody spitting on me either literally or verbally um, I want to know why it's worth it to keep staying alive or to find any kind of faith in you and that night I had a dream where I got up and looked in a mirror my skin melted off, I grew horns, and everything in my room turned fire. The house burned away, and I saw hell. I saw all kinds of horrible things where people were just being butchered and having all kinds of horrible things with fire all over the place. And it was dark. The only light that you had was a few flickers of fire showing you what was going on behind it. So, I mean, that was when, that was like a very strong moment in my life where I decided, you know what, if God cares enough about me to show me that kind of a sign, then he accepts me for who I am, and that's all I'm going to believe. I mean, people can put me down now, and I'll just be like, thanks, whatever. Uh, why did you interpret that dream as being that that's an okay, a sign is okay for what you do, instead of maybe interpreting the dream as a warning not to go that direction in life. It was a warning. I took it as the warning that the path that I was going on, that was where I was going to end up if I kept on going down that path. I was going to see all that. And I, you just said if you kept going down the path of the gay lifestyle that you were going to end up in that... No, not the gay lifestyle. I was talking about the, the dark stuff that I was doing. And so you're talking about when you were into the, the witchcraft and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, when I was into that kind of stuff, that was what my main focus on asking for a sign was. And the gay stuff, I don't know. I just... I, I really Because I want to ask you this, because if you know, it just with that vivid description you just gave us, and God works through visions and dreams. The Bible is very explicit about that. And, he, and, he's, and most of the time they're a wake-up call to, to get your act together, okay? But if there's demons and dark side that work with uh, the, the magic arts and stuff you were, you were working with, and God says not to uh, be into having homosexual sex, do you think there can also be demons involved in pulling people down the wrong road into sexual sin? Um, like I said, the, with the difference between what I believe in homosexuality, I mean, acting on just primal lust, I think that, I mean, it's one, it's, it's in the Bible that lust is bad. So if you go and act on your primal lust or just have any kind of lust, I think it's a bad thing. But I don't think that it's a bad thing if you can't help it if like you've gone down and you've had this damaging point in your life that causes you to be that way or you just happen to be that way I don't I don't think that God would judge you quite as harshly over that as if you were just doing it just for that you know just for the sex just to let out your lustful ways I I, I mean it's, it's a confusing subject I mean I can't say I can't sit here and say you know I'm not going to hell because I'm gay I'm going to hell because of this and this and this because I don't know I mean nobody really knows I mean there are certain things that are in the Bible that are they seem harsh of why you're gonna go to hell for it I mean why it's a sin and you know stuff like that it seems so harsh to say that you can go to hell for that and there are other things that just it seems kind of weird that you would go to hell for it I mean it, it's just it depends on I'm lost. <laughs> no, I just, 
I just think you're open and honest. I think you're doing a lot of processing on what's going on. And what I wanted to ask you was, early in the conversation, you said if you could be uh, straight instead of gay, you mentioned that you would want that. I would want it because of what it's caused. Like, I think just about any gay person, if they had the choice, if they aren't just acting on lust, if, if they could be accepted, if that was the only way they could be accepted, like around here, it doesn't matter if you're gay or straight. I mean, this shows you the difference between gay people and straight people. I mean, I'm not saying that all straight people are jerks that won't accept people, because I, I have a lot of people that are supportive of me. But here, if you're a straight person, and say you're a guy and a girl couple, if you kiss, nobody's going to look at you dirty. But also, you can't look at us dirty if we're same-sex kissing or something, or holding hands or something. But you got to look at it. They get to do whatever they want to outside, and they don't get judged because of that. Because it doesn't say in the Bible that two straight people having sex is bad. It's just that they look it up in the Bible where it says that same-sex having sex is bad. Did you know that uh, in the community of the world, that there have been thousands upon thousands, literally upon thousands of people who have left the gay lifestyle and gone into the heterosexual lifestyle? Yeah, I've heard about that kind of stuff. And um, my ex-boyfriend, my recent ex-boyfriend's mother tried to tell me, you know, that there's books and there's seminars and there's all this kind of stuff about how you can change from being gay to straight. Well, we shouldn't have to change. I mean, we... I mean, it's, it's talking about, you know, going to, you don't have to be gay and all this kind of stuff. Well, we don't have to be gay. We can change our ways. We can, we can start, you know, having sex with the other. But, I mean, what's done is done. We have done it. And we can't ask for forgiveness for it. We can. Well, what's interesting is what they're finding is the, the ones that are having long-term... Uh, uh, the ones that are having long, long-term success, okay, so to speak, it's the ones who come to a change through what Jesus Christ has done. As Jesus changes the heart and molds the heart, uh, there's a guy that uh, I've been to his website a few times, uh, Stephen Bennett Ministries, and he's an ex-homosexual, slept with over a hundred partners during his time, married with two kids. Now he's in the ministry, reaching out to lost. Well, they they found that Jesus Christ can change our not programs, but the love of Jesus Christ, and then through certain steps can actually change a heart, so someone can go and get married and have kids and stuff like that. Well, I like I said, I've. I've had a lot of conversations with God because I, I don't now don't take this the wrong way of me saying that it's bad to pray in the regular way. But my way of prayer is just talking to God. Like I'll take a time, like right before I'm going to sleep is usually the time that I do it. I just have a conversation with God. I know I'm not getting an answer back, but He finds a way to answer me when I ask a question. He finds a way. So I have a conversation, and I told. God at, on one occasion, actually a few occasions, that if I wasn't supposed to be gay, send me a woman that I can be attracted to the way that I'm attracted to men. And I haven't found one yet. But I did recently have a boyfriend that was great, made me feel wonderful, and even pulled me even farther away from how I was feeling, the bad way that I was feeling. That relationship is over with? Oh yeah, it was over with yesterday. But I mean, it's it, it didn't hurt me or anything. Because, I mean, just, it made such an impact on me and everything. I was just like, God, if it's okay for me to be gay, send me someone. Let me find love. Because that's all I want. A um, couple more questions will be done. Even. Great. Um, again, don't have to answer this if you don't want to. Uh, have you ever uh, slept with or been with uh, a female? I attempted it one time. It was kind of funny. Um, technically, when it came to the part of actually doing that, um, I was kind of like a 60-year-old man, and Viagra wouldn't have worked, kind of thing, if you know what I mean. I hope there's some 60-year-old men watching the video. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm not saying all 60-year-old men, because some of them can still do it. I mean, you never know. It didn't work, basically. Yeah, it, it didn't work. I mean, I could not, I mean, I can be attracted to a girl and say that she's beautiful. I mean, I think she's gorgeous, but the thing is... It's it's a different kind of attraction. No, it was interesting because I, I just saw a study recently that said that 91% of all gay men have slept with at least one woman 
during their time. I mean, yeah. I, I couldn't get as far as they did. I mean, I've had friends that are totally gay. They they make me look straight the way that they act and everything. But they've been able to sleep with women. And I just I can't do it. Yeah, and it seems like it's getting back more to a choice on choosing who I want to be with instead of just born a certain way. And I think that goes back to the societal yeah, factors in making a choice to do that. That's why I say it's a really confusing subject to see whether or not it's a choice or it just happens. I mean, with me, it felt like it just happened because I never, you know, woke up one morning and said, you know, I don't want girls, I want boys. I mean, I just, it's just the way that things just ended up happening with me. And I feel comfortable now with that. So I wouldn't want to change the way that I'm feeling just because I want to, it's just like if it happens, it happens. You know, if I find someone that I and he's tried like since we were little. You know, he's tried to have girlfriends and he's tried to have you know meaningful, serious relationships, and he's never been able to do it. Yeah, and I think it's uh, and, and again, I just got to be honest from the Bible perspective. Only Jesus Christ can change the heart. There is nothing external. It's it's always going to be an internal change. If uh, if we could get you some information on uh, some people that have been in that lifestyle but through what Jesus Christ has done to help change that and give you some information just for you to, to read or listen to a CD something like that would you be interested in that um I mean I'll listen to anything I'm I'm probably the most open-minded person that I know but I mean it's not going to change my mind I mean I told I mean in countless conversations with my spiritual conversations with God I have asked for you know if it's a bad thing to you let me find a relationship with a woman that will actually work because I mean I'd be more than willing to I mean if I could find the kind of relationship with a woman that I have found with guys then you know so be it you know I'll do it whatever if I can get to that point of such attraction and such love for that person that it can be a meaningful relationship it's, it's like I said I mean I look for love I'm not in it for the sex or the lust or anything like that. I want love. Um, then I think you're being very honest because I think that's what uh, every single person on planet, one of the yearnings they have for. The Bible says God has said eternity in our hearts. I think we're trying to find out is there a God that loves me and cares about me and can I know that? Also, and I think Satan's trick is, one of his tricks, is to get us chasing after lust instead of love. I can look at someone and say, my God, and I'll actually not be taking God's name in vain. I'll be like, God, that person looks good. I mean, they are a beautiful person. I go for personalities, too. At the end of our day yesterday, we had a conversation with Robbie, Kathy, and Tamara, and our battery died on us, so you didn't get to see the end of it. At the end of it, um, we were talking, and, and Robbie actually wanted some more information on uh, getting out of the gay lifestyle so he doesn't like to read so we're gonna get him some CDs from some different ministries that he can listen to to get him some of that information also it was interesting uh, Kathy told me later the mom of Tamara said that she had never heard Robbie talk this much about this before so you can see if you sit down with people and they feel comfortable as you're chatting with them people just begin to open up and he shared so many things with us yesterday I just thought it was such a beautiful conversation and then even one step beyond that uh, Greg and Dave have been helping me this weekend Dave walked up to Kathy and Tamara and began to talk with them, and he realized he knew them. He knew them from years ago, and Tamara, the, the young lady there, he used to pick up Tamara and bring her to vacation Bible school years and years ago. And that's what I want to encourage you with. You just don't understand the divine appointments God can give us out at an event like this. But if we be faithful and get out there and do that, they are waiting for us and hungry for truth. Hi, right, we're on the streets here, and your name is? Eddie Beeson. Okay, Eddie. And I was walking around, and one thing to tell you, just look at people's shirts. And stuff. I was looking at Eddie's shirt, and it's a St. David's uh, community church. It's not a black, white thing. It's not a Protestant, Catholic thing. It's not a gay, straight thing. It's a Jesus thing. And so are, what group are you here with? I'm here with St. David, my church. Okay, so St. David's. And what type of uh, church is it? Uh, it's uh, interdenominational. We're out in Gwinnett County. Currently, we're in uh, the Civic Center at, at Gwinnett County. And we had we meet every Sunday morning at 10:30, just one service a week, but it lasts us all week. Okay. <laughs> and uh, y'all, you were telling me you have a booth set up here and stuff. Yeah, like that. we're down at uh, P16, the main the main road here, and uh, our pastor is uh, Greg Kennard, and uh, 
He's just very energetic and very uh, open and, and just loving arms. And so um, what, why, why do y'all have a booth set up? What was the reasoning behind doing that? Uh, Greg wanted to have a, a presence here because he's, we're an all accepting church. We want everybody to be comfortable, come to, and, and, and worship together and, and just be comfortable there. And so he wants to have, just like the shirt says, he wants to have everybody of, of any color or belief to, to come and be comfortable. I was, I was listening to a tape the other day and this guy said, uh, everybody should be, feel welcome at your church. But he said if truth is preached, they, not everybody should feel comfortable. Well, that was an interesting statement because I think everyone, if you're a Christian, should treat it so they feel welcome around you. But if you speak truth, not everyone's going to be comfortable when truth is being preached. Well, look, that's very true. I agree with you, and and that is what we do as well. I mean, that's why we say Catholic and 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 other religions, you know, come there, listen to what he has to say, you know, God's message through him, and accept it as much as they want, and and leave the rest alone. Whatever is comfortable with them, and they believe, and, and it feels moves them and that's what you know, we don't try to change anybody. Uh, Eddie, do you believe there is uh, right and wrong? Do you believe there's right and wrong? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so wh what is your standard for determining what is right and what is wrong? Well, if, if it brings, if whatever you do, if it brings harm to you or someone else, in my personal belief, and, and uh, because God is the one that's going to forgive us in, in the end, not to, not to be judgmental, we should never be judgmental as to one another, but just you know, within your heart, you're going to know your limit, and and God will tell you when you you need to stop. <laughs> and do you believe that uh, the Bible contains truth on right and wrong? Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, if uh, do you believe murder is wrong? Uh, yes. Uh, and do you believe rape is wrong? Oh, yes. Uh, do you believe that um, uh, committing adultery is wrong? Yes. All right. And the Bible is very explicit on all of those. Uh, do you believe if you have teenagers at your church that are getting involved in sexual relations before they're married, do you believe that is wrong? Yes. And so do you believe that also if two men or two women lay together and have sex together, do you believe that's wrong also? Uh, no. Okay. And, and why don't you believe that that is wrong? Well, I, I can't say it like my pastor did, but he, you know, he, I wish you were here to be interviewing him. But, uh, you know, there's many uh, interpretations of the Bible. and. That one is always brought out and you know and and very strong, but it's just we just believe in love, you know, love God and love people and, and love each other, and you know it's just. So why why would you believe that those other sexual sins were wrong, but that sexual sin is not wrong? Well, all those others are violent sins, and they're well. Well, if if uh, two people are condoning an adultery, it's not a violent sin. Oh, okay, no, that's not. But I mean, it's still. You put me on the spot. I ask you not to ask me hard questions. Well, but I'm doing the well, best I can to answer. No, I don't believe it's wrong. Uh, and but I mean, even though I don't particularly in the open, you know, the holding hands and kissing in public and all that, I think it should be a private thing in your home. But I don't feel it's wrong because it's between two loving people. And God's a loving God, and He's going to love us the way we are. And the, the reason I did that, I wasn't trying to put you on the spot, uh, because I have a lot of people that will tell me, uh, that they kind of do the buffet approach with the Bible. Like, they'll believe this and they'll do that, but as soon as that one contradicts it, I don't want to believe that one, I don't want to believe that one. What hit me one day is if I'm reading in the newspaper, uh, I read an article, I accept that it's being true until it tells me it's not true. If I'm reading a book and it says fiction, I know that's a non-true book, and I just know that. And what I couldn't figure out when I began studying different religions a few years ago is that uh, as I studied all the historical evidence and the archaeological evidence and fulfilled prophecies, I know you can prove the Bible true. It's very easy to do. But what hit me was, as I began to read it, I couldn't just say, well, that one's not true and that is true, because I couldn't decide where to stop and where to start. And so what I had to do is I read it, I had to realize that as the information played itself, I may not agree with something, but that doesn't make me the judge of it. God's the judge on whether that book is true or not. Well, it was brought out uh, last week or last week in the service that you know the Old Testament. We, we believe the whole Bible, but the Old Testament it, it's more of a chastising. And you see, uh, we see a uh, we're like like a better word, a bad side of God because He's like always bringing plagues and punishment for this and that. And that. But then when Jesus came, it's more of a loving, forgiving, accepting. You know, so we, we flow in that direction, I do, in our church stuff. But we believe also that uh, the Old Testament as well. Right. But it's just, but it's like the law, the Jewish law, and 
the uh, it was just very punishing if you read so many of the things, all the plagues and everything. But right. when Jesus came, it was t turned, changed, and everything was just loving and caring, and, and there was no uh, uh, for the sick and all. They would just they would put them away or kill them or whatever. Where Jesus would heal and and. and be kind and accept to everybody. If you had someone at your church that um, was smoking, let's say, and you knew that was going to take years off your life, would you encourage them not to smoke? I do that anyway, whether it's my church or not. Oh, you encourage people not to smoke? I do. I mean, I, I smoked, uh, but I quit in 74. And, you haven't uh, smoked since 1974? I have not. Oh, awesome. <laughs> uh, if, if someone at your church or anywhere was using drugs, and or, or alcohol just abusing it that you could see physically it was tearing them down and they were going to kill themselves would you try to encourage them to get off that absolutely, absolutely. Um, i saw the other day that uh, i tried this someone challenged me to try this and i went to google a uh, search engine on the website on the, on the internet and i put in homosexual lifestyle and i hit enter do you know what shows up when you hit enter no i haven't been. i was blown away Study after study after study all across the world that on average a homosexual will lose 20 to 30 years off their lifespan compared to a heterosexual. 30 years younger they're dying. Average homosexual dying at 42 years old. And I actually asked a lesbian this the other day, and she looked and said, oh, I know why. I said, well, why? She said the suicide rate is so high in the gay community. She said um, the drug and alcohol use is so high in the gay community. And she said, of course, the diseases that can cut our lives short of that. So knowing that, don't you think you'd also want to encourage people not to continue to walk down that road if it's going to cut their lifespan by that much? No, oh, absolutely, and I do. So, I mean, I, I drink, so I drink in moderation, but, you know, it's, and I don't use drugs, but I, I never have. But, yes, I, we we and I do encourage people the best life we can. I talk to them. get out of a lot of friends that do some of that. And I, I, I'm always on to them. I said, please, you know, you need to quit smoking. You, you know, they don't how about a little bit? And how about uh, getting out of the gay lifestyle since they're dying so much younger than heterosexual? I think that should be a choice. Uh, I mean... I don't encourage that because I am gay and I don't uh, I don't plan to get out of lifestyle. I just have to know how to live it to be to take care of myself as best I can. You know, and and if someone can't handle it, they need to find some some uh, counseling or something. You know, don't do the suicide thing. But you know, I try to you know, talk to people about that too. But they're gonna, people are going to do what they're going to do, and it's, it's sad, but it does happen a lot. And uh, what do you believe happens to us after we die? What do you believe happens? I've always believed that we do. Our soul does go to heaven. Heaven is not necessarily in the sky up there somewhere we always point, but we you know that we will be accepted into the kingdom. And do you believe there's a hell also? Oh, absolutely. And so, what separates who would get heaven and who would get hell? And those that believe in Jesus Christ and have given them their life to Him will, will, will be in heaven. So you believe that anyone who has not surrendered their heart and life to Jesus Christ will actually go to hell for all of eternity? That's the way I've been taught in my life, so yeah, I do believe that. Okay. And so are you doing anything to impact anybody's life to make sure lost people make sure that they're not going to hell for eternity? I witness about Christ as often as I can, you know, with people, and you know, some of you reject it, they don't even hear about it, talk about it, but that's why we're here today, so we can right. present that, that image and, and talk to people today. So if someone says to you that uh, Jesus is no different than Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius, how would you respond to that? I don't know that much about those, the other religions, uh, but from what I've seen and heard, I, they're not as a loving, uh, I don't see them being as a loving and accepting, but certainly not as an accepting as Christ would be, Christ believers. Uh, you've heard of the Ten Commandments, right? And we've all told a lie, which makes us a liar. We've all stolen something that makes us a thief. We've all lusted in our heart, which is the same as adultery, Jesus said. Uh, we've been angry with somebody without cause, the Bible says, and that's the same as murder, because he's checking our insides as well as our outsides. I looked at that standard one day, and all of us, six billion of us, are liars and thieves and blasphemers and adulterers and murderers by that standard, which means six billion of us would be guilty on Judgment Day and would mean hell unless God provided a way out. So what's the difference about Jesus Christ as being the way out versus all those other religious figures I mentioned? Well, I don't believe that they're going to hell. I mean, yeah, he's, everybody has to work out their own inner salvation. And I don't know their beliefs totally, but they, 
I can't answer that. But well, and the reason, that. no, you're, you're okay. Uh, because what hit me when I studied a bunch of religions a few years ago is when I studied them, only, okay, uh, only out of all those religions that the blood of Jesus could wash you as pure and as white as snow and erase all your sins. Nothing in Islam could do it, nothing in Hinduism, nothing in Buddhism, nothing in Zoroastrianism. And I realized that was the answer. And then he backed it up three days later with the resurrection. Predicted his own death, predicted he was going to have a grave, and predicted he would rise from the dead. Muhammad didn't do it, Buddha didn't do it, Confucius didn't do it, and I realized I had the right answer. And then when he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except me, that let me know without a doubt that this is the right answer that the world's looking for, whether they know it or whether they don't. And that's why we have to share that with them. Well, that is, that's the way I believe. Like I said, I don't know the other religions that well to know. And I'm assuming they don't believe that, you know, they believe other ways of entering into wherever the afterlife they go. But as far as I believe, it, it is uh, through Jesus Christ's blood. Uh, are you a reader? Do you like to read? Uh, not much. No, I don't. Eddie, <laughs> you're standing in front of a famous author, Eddie. I want to sign one of my books and give you one of my books. I'll read it. If I sign one, you'll read it? I'll read it. Well, you know, if you don't sign it, I'll read it. <laughs> hey, I just want to thank, thank you, Eddie, so much for your help. Uh, You're very welcome. Stuff like that, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much, okay? Uh, what's your name? Reese. Reese. Spell that for me. R-E-E-S-E. R-E-S-E. How old are you, Reese? I'm 21. Uh, are you from Atlanta? No, I'm from Denver. Denver, Colorado. All right, I got relatives in Lakewood. That's pretty close. Okay. Uh, what you doing in Atlanta? I'm uh, visiting friends and going to Pride. Okay, so you came here just for the Pride Festival? Um, I go to school in Ohio, so it's like an eight-hour drive. You drove eight hours for the Pride Festival? Yes. Okay. Uh, and what was your main reason wanting to come to Pride this year? I have not been to Pride in Atlanta. I thought that it was a, it should be a, a good event. Okay. You go to other Pride Festivals around the country? I have in the past. How old are you? I'm 21. Okay. Um, uh, so are you a lesbian? No, I'm not. Uh, heterosexual? I'm not heterosexual either. Okay, let me keep guessing here. Um, how about bisexual? Um, no, I would probably simply identify as queer. As queer? Believing that uh, binary terms are arbitrary, as are terms uh, of um, gender orientation and sexual orientation. Okay. Um, do you have any, uh, after 21 years of life, do you have any uh, spiritual beliefs? I do. And so, what are those? I'm a Christian. Okay. And why did you choose uh, Christianity? Um, I was basically raised that way. My father's a Messianic Jew, and that's kind of how I identify as well. Okay, so your your father is a Jewish man who's received Yeshua, Jesus as Messiah. Yes. yes. Uh, what, and do you know why he did that? Um, I'm not entirely sure why. I don't remember his story entirely, but he went to seminary and things like this for a while. So. Because there are actually a lot of Jewish people who are now uh, receiving Yeshua as Messiah, but after studying the scriptures, they see he equaled all the prophecies and stuff. And I think I think that's what my dad did too. Okay. And have you done any studying along those lines? I've done the same sort of studying. Okay. And so, when you die, uh, being a Christian, what do you think happens after we walk out of here? What do you think happens? Um, I tend to believe along the traditional lines of uh, eternal life, and I take that pretty uh, pretty literally. What the Bible has taught me in the past. All right, so do you believe there's a heaven or hell after we die? I tend to believe in both. All right, so if you died today, which place would you go? Um, I would hope to go to heaven. Uh, um, being that I do still pray daily and ask for forgiveness for my sins. So, okay, and you hope to go to heaven. Do you think you can know if you would go to heaven? Do you think you know it? Well, I think I do know only because I do believe in, uh, in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I think that that's... From my like, from the way that I've been taught, that's the criteria: is believing and, and atoning for my sins. Okay. And do you atone for your sins, or does Jesus atone for your sins? Um, no, no, He has. Okay. As the sacrificial lamb, ideal. All right. And you've heard of the Ten Commandments, right? Yeah. Uh, because uh, the Ten Commandments is kind of the the standard, which which God's going to divide who gets heaven, who gets hell. All right. So, have you ever told a lie before? Um. Yeah. Okay. So, what would that make you if you told a lie? Um, what would that make me? Yeah. A liar, sinner? Well, no, yeah, definitely. <laughs> at that moment, we'd be a liar at that moment right. when I told a lie. Okay. Have you ever stole something before? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Don't start. I kid when I accidentally took some gum. I didn't know you weren't supposed to. Okay, we've all, we've all nabbed something along the way. But if I stole something, what would that make you? Um, a thief. 
Okay, I was a thief too when I met something. Uh, have you ever uh, lusted in your heart before? Probably. And uh, Jesus in the Beatitudes said, even if you've looked upon a woman with lust, it's the same as committing adultery, because he checks your insides as well as your outsides. Uh, you ever take the Lord's name in vain? No. Okay, don't start. Um, that I don't do. <laughs> good, don't. Uh, I used to. Uh, have you ever been angry with somebody? Yes. All right. And Jesus said, even if you've been angry with someone without cause, it's the same as committing murder if you've done that. Okay. All right. So by looking at that standard, you just told me you're a liar, a thief, an adulterer, and a murderer by that standard. Right. So would you be guilty or not guilty on Judgment Day by that standard? Um, guilty, but still, again, according to my beliefs, because I've asked. Uh, the Lord God to forgive me for my sins, then I would be forgiven. And so your belief is that as long as you repent of your sin and surrender underneath the blood of Jesus Christ, you'll be washed clean of all that sin. That is my belief. And uh, actually, you know, the blood of Jesus can wash you clean of every sin you've ever committed. And that's what I've read as well. And you know the Bible to be true. I, I do. I believe it is. Now, you've made a commitment to Jesus Christ, you said. Yes, I believe I have. And you've repented of your sin? Yes. Right. And um, do you and do you live your faith out? Do you act, Reese, like a 21-year-old Christian woman should act? Um, well, again, because of certain like beliefs that I have, and I'm a social constructionist as well, and I believe that many of our uh, identity characteristics are socially constructed, i.e. like um, gender orientation, gender identity. Um, so I believe that uh, gender terms such as male and female are are uh, the, the binary is very arbitrary and also very socially constructed. So I tend not to identify necessarily as either, which I know in some people's beliefs is uh, contradictory to my Christian beliefs, but um, in my studying of um, not only like the Bible, but the Hebrew scripture, um, I have come to my own conclusions about those ideas. So in some in some senses, I think that I, I fall short. Um, in some ways, I think I, I am pretty open about my beliefs, and I'll talk about them when I need to, and that's a lot of my friends don't believe that way, so it's in that way I think I do, but in other ways, probably fail. Uh, now, you said earlier that you believe the Bible to be true, yeah. and it does use male and female gender, so uh, yeah. is that true there? In, uh, in um, the original Hebrew text, it's uh, some of the... Uh, some of the scriptures, like in Leviticus, the ones that are used to condemn homosexuality, are not entirely accurate, according to my like interpretation of reading Hebrew scriptures. So that's like, and I know that's up for debate, but. Uh, and so, as a believer in Jesus Christ, do you share your faith in Jesus Christ with people? Um, share as in, do I attempt to witness to people, or do I? Yeah, the Bible is very explicit. When we die, there is a hell. I mean, there is a hell for people who have not repented of their sin and put it underneath the blood of Jesus Christ. You stated you know that to be true, and if you know that to be true, that would mean we'd all have friends that would be going to hell. So my question is, do you witness to them about repenting of sin and being right with Jesus Christ? I do, and I, I, I tend to only when uh, I feel like the people are um, willing to listen to go to the extent of um, talking about those beliefs entirely candidly or in the sense of, uh, you know, you could have this too, you should believe this too, more or less like I come about it in the sense that, hey, this is what I believe, and uh, this is what I believe to be true, and it's, it, I guess it's a passive attempt, given like many people that I know who don't believe what I believe in it. If you were uh, walking by a pool and you saw a child uh, drowning in a pool, um, would you give it a passive attempt to save that child, or would you jump in that pool as quick as you could and get that child out of there? No, I would probably jump in the pool and get that child out as quickly as possible. It wouldn't matter if we were fully clothed. We would be in that pool and make sure that child did not die. And what hit me was, as I continue to read the scriptures, is that hell is a real place. People are going off to a, a worse place than drowning in a pool. You know that, I know that, and if I would jump in a pool fully closed, I should be running in these people's lives to make sure that they don't go anywhere near hell when they die. Right, right. Um, but also in my like in my lifetime, I've um, been witness to people who've uh, taken more of an aggressive attempt. Um, I have family members who've done such, and it's it's failed because people feel as if it's being pushed upon them, and it's not coming in out of a. Um, out of a place of, of love and uh, and sharing and necessity, it's coming from a place of like I'm right, you're wrong. And uh, so I've yet to figure out how to actually get my um, beliefs across without. And one of the things the, the Bible says is speak the truth in love. Right. One of the things we do, we're out here talking to people at the festival, 
but we're pretty strong. We will share Jesus Christ with people, but we will try to do it in such a loving way. I actually just had a couple guys that just said thank you for how you're sharing your faith, that we just talk with people, plant the seed, and it's God's job to make that seed grow. Right. <laughs> so we want to encourage you to do the same thing with that, okay? Yes. Cool. I'm going to pray for you, okay? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Reese. What a nice young lady. Thanks for letting us meet her today, Father God, and bring her down from Ohio. I just ask you're going to continue to draw her to the scriptures, Father God. It seems like she loves to study that. Boy, there's nothing like reading your word. That the scriptures are going to come alive to her, Father God. She's going to understand the truths in there. Repentance and the cross more than she ever has before. And me also, Father. And burden her heart for her friends. Father, she'll have such a desire to make sure they know your son, Jesus Christ, Father God. That she'll plant those seeds. And Father, we know without a doubt you are faithful to make those seeds grow. So we want to thank you for that. And thanks for giving us a chance to talk with Reese today. And we thank you for it. And we ask in the great name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, cool, girl. Okay, now after you just saw that conversation with Reese, I just ask you who's watching for you to pray for her, that God will continue to work through her for truth. You can even see as a believer, as all the studies she's done, untruth can seep in there from other different areas. And so we got to know the word, believe the word, and live by that word. So pray she'll be drawn back to the Bible and she'll know that word to be true and stand up for that. Okay, uh, what's your name? Kenny. Hey, Kenny and? Veronica. Veronica. Kenny and Veronica, right? Okay, y'all, where do y'all live? I live in Fabern. Atlanta. Atlanta, yeah. Okay, we're here at the Pride Festival, okay? Uh, do y'all come down every year? Yes, now. Okay. Uh, question for you. Why Why is it? A, why do you come down every year? What's the reasons for that? I guess this is what I like. It's like being down here and stuff? Yes. Is this your first time? Yeah. What do you think so far? Uh, I just was wanted in just about a little bit ago, seeing what it's like. Okay. And uh, I lost one person already, lost Kenny, but we'll still talk with Veronica. And uh, Veronica, we're asking the question uh, that uh, when you die, what do you think happens after we die? What do you think happens? I go to my I go to my next level. So you go to the next level, all right? So does everyone when they die go to the next level? Yes. Okay. And so what level is that going to be for you? I wear the rest of my family is. So you're going to go back to where your family is. All right. And so is that a particular spiritual belief or religious faith or anything like that? A spiritual belief, a belief in energy because energy doesn't die. Energy will continue. That's right. It won't die. And so where do you get your information on this belief that we go to the next level? From my family. So is this something y'all talk about in the family? Yes. Do you uh, do y'all believe in any uh, religious faith like Muslim or Jewish or Christian anything like that? Well, all United Methodists. Y'all are United Methodists, so a Christian faith. Yes. Okay, so do you do you go to church? Yes. Do you go to a Methodist church? Yes. Uh, most Methodists believe when they die that there's going to be a heaven or hell when they die. Do you believe that? No, actually, most Methodists don't believe in hell. Oh, uh, what do they believe in? They'll believe in heaven, but there's not really a hell per se. Do you believe there's a, a heaven? Yes. Do you believe there's a hell? No. Uh, the other day I was speaking in Atlanta, and um, this woman came up to me after my talk, and she was an emergency room nurse, and she told me they had a patient go code red flatline. And they went over with uh, the paddles, and they paddled the person, and they came back too. And he started screaming. He said, the heat, the heat. Flatlined again. They paddled him, Veronica. He came back too. He started screaming. He said, the flames, the flames. Flatlined four different times. Heat the flames, heat the flames, heat the flames. And on the fourth one, he flatlined and he died. Okay? And she told me they stood there for three or four minutes just staring at this guy because they know exactly where he went. Where'd he go? I don't know. I wasn't thinking that. He was screaming hell before he got out of here. Okay? And do you know that's exactly... Do you believe the Bible to be true being a Methodist? I think so. Do you believe the Bible to be true since you're a Methodist? Yes, but I also believe the Bible was tempered by people because it was written by people. I do, however, believe in their God, and I believe in the basics of the Bible. Right. And one of the basics that hit me when I started studying a few years ago is that the Bible talks twice as much about hell than it does heaven. Did you know that? Well, actually, in my studies of the Bible, no, it does not seem to talk uh, twice about hell as it does heaven. But what uh, talk doesn't really talk that much about heaven either. However, it doesn't really talk a lot about him. It talks about what you need to be doing in your life to go on to your next life. That's the main thing that the Bible talks about, especially the New Testament. So what would you have to do in your life to make sure you are ready for the next level? The main thing that you want to do is you want to love other people. You treat people the way you want to be treated. You treat people with respect and dignity, and you have them treat you, and you don't cast stones about the people. Okay. And do you, uh, 
you've heard of the Ten Commandments. And do you believe in the Ten Commandments? Yes. Have you ever told a lie before? Absolutely. So what would that make you if you told a lie? It still makes me a person. It makes me human because we're all born in original sin. That's right. We're all human. Um, but if you if you murder someone, you're a murderer. If you rape, you're a rapist. If you tell a lie, you'll be a what? Well, the thing is, if, let me put it to you this way. If you did not get saved by the blood of Jesus, then you're, you're in a bad spot. However, if you repent of your sins, granted you are human. Humans are not expected to be are not expected to be perfect. We are all perfectly with Jesus. Right. But there's only one Messiah. So therefore, whether you lie or whether you don't, if you repent of your sins, you are cleansed of it thereof. So therefore, there are murderers, there are rapists, there are all sorts of bad people. It's where you're at in your head, and if you truly repent in your heart. Um, still looking at the Ten Commandments, so have you ever stolen anything before? Ah, uh, that's a personal question that I choose not to answer. How about yourself? Most definitely, Veronica. <laughs> Thank goodness for forgiveness, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, have you ever lusted in your heart before? Absolutely. Um, and Jesus said, even if you look upon a woman with lust, it's the same as committing adultery, because he's checking our insides as well as our outsides. Okay? I never looked upon a woman with lust. And actually, the inference, and that's okay too, uh, but the inference is that when we lust towards something that's not ours, as Jesus said, because if we see somebody made in the image of God, we should want to love them as someone made in the image of God and not lust for them in a certain way. Okay? They put in, put in your uh, carnal feelings also. So therefore, it seems to me, God doesn't make mistakes, first of all. So no, he doesn't. If he sits there and he can put those thoughts into your mind for sexual things, it's not a mistake unless you think God makes mistakes. Uh, now, again, do you believe the Bible to be true? Do you believe the Bible to be true? Because if you look at it that way, if you look at it in the sense of the Bible, if you believe God's made people in his own image, then what's part of us is of God's image. Okay. So therefore. And, and what hit me was, uh, do you believe there's also a devil? No, I don't believe in devil. You don't believe in an actual devil? I do believe in evil, but I don't believe in an actual devil, no. Okay. So do you believe there's temptation that happens in our world? Of course, people are tempted to do all sorts of things. Yeah, and the Bible says temptation does not come from God. Only good comes from God, but temptation actually comes from Satan and the enemy and our sin that tempts us to go the wrong way. There are enemies out there, granted. There are enemies out there. However, once again, the enemy is not like a little devil with little pointy ears and stuff like that. There are temptations out there. But like I say, everything comes from where your head's at and your heart. You're going to be put into success. You're going to be put into this. Granted, we don't always pass that test. That's where praying comes in. That's where uh, uh, your faith comes in. Right. People with a strong faith, you can get past all that type of stuff. I mean, you don't sit there and throw yourself into situations. Everyone's going to do wrong things. There's going to be temptation out there. It's not some little devil thing. Come here and take it. You know, but there are evil people out there. And see, and that's what the Ten Commandments, we've all stolen or lusted or been angry at people. Jesus said the same as murder. But that's where repentance, as you said earlier, comes in. And only the blood of Jesus can wash you clean of all that sin. Okay? So has there been a point in your life where you've actually repented of that sin? I've repented of a lot of sins. I feel my, in my heart, I'm a pretty good person. A very good person, actually. Because I don't never try to do wrong to other people. Have you ever done wrong to other people? I have done wrong to other people, but I don't do it no more. It's a part of growing up. It's a part of having faith. And that's what the Ten Commandments show us, that even as we uh, have continued life, that even one lie can make us a liar. Have you lied since you've been a believer in Jesus Christ? Absolutely. I've said that now before. However, like I say, it's all about repentance. It's about uh, forgiveness. You know. uh, do you read your Bible? Yes, I do. Uh, and do you, so, so you're telling me there's been a point where you've repented of your sin and accepted Jesus Christ? I have accepted Jesus Christ, yes. I have accepted Jesus Christ many, many years ago. Oh, so it was a long time ago when you did that? And uh, Yes, and I do it continuously every day. And I read my Bible every day. I also used to play for the, the Methodist Church for many, many years and write music for that. So. And do you, would you say you live your faith out? Do you live it out? I try as best I can, yes. And what do you think the biggest struggle is you have living that faith out? Addictions. Addictions to... Stuff. Okay, that's okay. I'm sorry. Um, that's okay. Uh, and do you believe by the power of Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ can break those addictions that you do not want to be addicted to, that person, that drug, that anything ever again? Do you think he can do that? Yes, I think about, about through the power of Jesus Christ he can. I know he can. Okay, but that's where we have to surrender underneath his will and let that power break that and do that. Okay? Now, do you believe as a believer in Jesus Christ you're supposed to share your faith in Jesus Christ? Yes. I believe you share your faith. I don't believe you need to cram it down a person's 
throat, which I find that happens quite often out here. Um, and do you, uh, the guy you're with is, uh, was, is Kenny, what's his name? Uh, have you taken time to share with Kenny about the truth about Jesus Christ? I had just met Kenny now about, about five minutes before I met you. <laughs> okay, a quick relationship there. Um, well, no, I didn't mean I mean a quick friendship. Uh, but, you know, I just met you, but yet it didn't take us very long to start talking about eternal things in Jesus Christ. Because what's the most important thing in your life you will share with other people? And if you love Jesus Christ and you want to make sure Kenny goes nowhere near hell, you know what? You'll share with him the truth about repentance in Jesus Christ, the sin of breaking those Ten Commandments, so he goes nowhere near that when he dies. Well, you could say that. Yes, I would. You know, I have no problem talking with people about it. The thing that I do have a problem with is when people say, for instance, if a person can hear so much and hear so much, then it's up to them. But when you keep talking and keep talking and keep talking, it tends to push people away from things, you know. Uh, I think you're right. We can't force it down someone's throat, but uh, we can speak the truth in love. And if you do love people, and that's what we're doing today. We're out here walking and talking with people, but we love these people enough. We want to make sure they have the right information for eternity. And it's their choice what to do with it, but we want to make sure we plan to see for Jesus Christ that they're going to come to heaven one day. That makes sense? That makes sense. Now, what I want to I am into, because you asked about the devil and all that. Now, you know what the Bible and if you notice in the older Bibles and other Bibles other than the King James Version, there's different writings and different things like that. And the Bible is also tempered by the period of times. So a lot of things that were said were said because of the people from those times. Prejudice, not everything is based on directly from what God said or what Jesus said. A lot of things are tempered from the area that it was in and how people felt about other stuff. And see what you have to do when you take, read the Bible. You have to sit there and take what's being said as not just everything verbatim, because a lot of things were, that they don't, a lot of people don't consider is because of the time and the, the rituals of that time. And anything we read, whether it's a book, a newspaper, a magazine, we take it as being true until we know it not to be true. That's correct. Anything we read, we read it as being true. You read the newspaper. When I read the newspaper, I accept it to be true until I know they do something that, that I know not to be true. I don't always do that. I read a book to be true unless there's fiction across the I top, because then I know it's not true. No, I have to. I have to I, a lot of times, especially with newspapers and stuff, I want to find out. I find out through more than just one source. Okay. Because the fact newspapers, just like anything else, have biased opinions. Okay, that's a good point, because we actually look for supporting evidence. And the thing is, when I read the Bible, I read it to be true until it's telling me that it's not necessarily a true statement per se. For instance, when Jesus uses parables, that actual story may just be a story to make a point. Now, it may have actually occurred, but it's letting you know it's a parable to make a point is what they're trying to do, all right? But I also agree with it. We also look at other evidence, and when you look at the historical evidence, the archaeological evidence, you can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that that Bible is true by looking at all the external stuff to do that, okay? Right, but what I'm saying is, say, for instance, during certain times, it's just like people are not always considered equal. Okay, they used to write books about uh, black people not even being people. That does not mean it's true because it's written. Okay, it all depends on the time and the area and what's going on at that time. So what might be written in the Bible, just like men and women were not considered equal during that time. So a woman's going to be considered at a different level than a man. But that doesn't mean that's true. You make a good point, because one of the things that I think would help stop racism in our country is two things. One, science. If you put black skin underneath a microscope, and you put my lily white skin underneath that microscope, do you know it's the exact same skin? There is no scientific difference. There's just more melanin that's risen to the top on a black person. The other thing is because I know the Bible to be true, it says in the book of Genesis, the very first book, that every single person is made in the image of God. You, me, every person walking in this festival, everyone watching this video is made in the image of Almighty God. And once I know you're made in the image of God, no matter how God decides to wrap that package, it doesn't matter. You're that special to Almighty God. And so if people get back to know the scriptures, they stop looking at just the package, whether someone's tall or short or muscular, black, white, Hispanic, and they see the beautiful creations that Almighty God has made. But because of our fallen nature and sin, we've all broken his commandments and we desperately need a savior and that's what jesus christ did for us have you seen the movie the passion yes and boy i tell you what it gives you a much better understanding of what he's done for us and now that we know that we have to boldly step up for what he's done for us you know what's interesting about that movie more so than what christ had done for us i was more taken by what his mother had to go through that must have killed her 
And to know from birth that she's going to have to go through that. As you know, from the birth of him. That, that, you know, a lot of people don't seem to realize so much that other people do for other people. I took a Muslim family to go see The Passion, and uh, it was a husband, a wife, and about a 13-year-old son. And the mother just got so hit with some of those Mary and Jesus scenes right there. She had to go and see what was going to happen to the son that she had raised. And that hit, that hit me hard as I watched the movie. But one thing that hit me was, as much as it must have bothered the earthly mother, the heavenly father, God the father, how much it had to hurt him as his son was going to die for the sins of the world. But yet he knew it was worth going through. Jesus knew it was worth going through because you're that special to him and all these people are, but yet they don't know it yet. But that's why we have to take that truth to them to make sure they understand the truth. Yes, that's true. All right. You've been great. Anything uh, you want to say, anything we can do to encourage you or to help you out, anything we can do? No, I'm fine. I've, I've always felt, I feel totally loved by my God the Father, and I feel totally loved by my family. You know, and I'm just very, a very happy person. I want to thank you for helping us out, Veronica, in your openness and your honesty. We really do appreciate that. Okay? Awesome. Uh, you just saw the uh, conversation we had with Veronica, which was a real interesting conversation. So I just hope you'll pray that she'll be drawn to the Word and know that Bible to be true. Uh, we gave her the book I wrote afterwards, and hopefully it's going to encourage her to share her faith. But you know, God in His graciousness, um, she had just met that Kenny guy, and that might have been a bad relationship. But during you saw during the conversation that Kenny took off and walked away, and he's gone, and she went the other direction. So maybe one of the reasons God sent us there was to split those two up so nothing was going to happen between them. So sometimes, you know, you don't always know why God sends you to people, but we just have to be faithful uh, to plant those seeds and then just watch the Spirit do His things in people's lives. So I hope that was an encouragement to you as you, as you saw that conversation. I just found out that uh, before the interview took place that we actually we have people sign a release form. And so when I was getting Veronica to sign the release form, uh, a gentleman walked up to uh, Kenny and asked him, do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? And that kind of ruffled Kenny. You saw he didn't last very long in that conversation. I think it was a good thing we need to learn and a good teaching tool. When Jesus sat down with the woman at the well, he did not walk up to him and said, do you know, walk up to her and sit down, do you know Yahweh or do you know me as your personal Savior? He started just talking with her about water, natural things. Then he made the swing to living water, supernatural things. Then he said, hey, where's your, where's your husband at? And she didn't have one. I said, he said, you have five husbands and he knew about her adultery. She had broken the seventh commandment. So you can see the difference there. If you come up too hard and too quick on people, again, they don't know why they need Jesus if you just tell them about Jesus. But once you walk them through the sin, the Ten Commandments and the Law, now they want to know why they need Jesus Christ after that. And I think that was just a powerful teaching thing that all of us can learn right there. As John Wesley said, preach 90% law, 10% grace. And when you just come up and just shove the Jesus on them, it can be so offensive to them, they want to run away. But yet, we'd rather just talk with them and do that. So I think that was a good teaching until we can all learn. Let's talk with people and share our faith with them. We already have people today here thanking us for sharing our faith with them, but just how we're doing it. We're just talking to them and getting into conversations. And I just think that's the biblical way, whether it's the rich young ruler uh, that Jesus talked to, whether it's Jesus the woman at the well, or, or uh, Paul talking to King Agrippa. We just sit down and we chat with people and give them the truth. Okay, we're here in the streets of Atlanta, and um, we're talking with, uh, what's your first name? Gary. Okay, uh, I met Gary, and Gary, you, you said I've met you before, is that correct? Yes, last year at Pride. Okay, I ran to Gary uh, at Pride and how'd you remember me this year? Your hat. Everybody says my hat. Everyone I'm out with everybody knows me by my hats and stuff. And um, so, did we talk last year? Uh, yeah, for about 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, we had a good chat for uh, 10 or 15. What, what, what did we chat about? Uh, just how the weekend was going, how Pride was, how the day was, uh, a couple of faith questions, uh, what do you do for a living, that type thing. Okay. Just general conversation. Okay, and a year later, we were talking early before we got on camera here. Uh, what uh, what do you do for a living? Uh, I work in a medical research and reference laboratory. All right, and how many people do you have working for? Uh, there's about 460 people in my departments. 460 people work for you. Is that a well-paying job? It pays enough. <laughs> pays my bills. And we didn't have the microphone on the first time we interviewed Gary, and I asked him this question. I'm asking it again. Can I borrow some money, Gary? Uh, no, because I have bills to pay. <laughs> All right. Is that a stressful job? Very stressful. Uh, and how do you relieve that stress as you go through life? Uh, my favorite thing is dancing. Um, I just turn on some music, whether it be at my house or at a club, and just dance until I get tired. 
it's a positive way to release negative energy. Okay. So uh, getting out there and sweating and just dancing and doing that. I know a lot of people that like to run and just do different physical exercises to kind of relieve the stress of life and do that. Right? Yeah, it's just the same thing, a form of exercise, but instead you're doing it to music and it's on a dance floor or on the floor in your house as far as dancing. Right. I also know people actually use drug and alcohol also to relieve the stress. Is that does that cause you to do that also? Or? No, not. I mean, yes, I drink every once in a while, but I don't use alcohol as a way to relieve stress. To relieve stress. Actually, alcohol and drugs just compound stress before it's all said and done. I think you're right. I don't think a lot of people realize that as they go through it. Though. Um, now we we noticed the um, uh, again. I'm, we're just gonna make an assumption you weren't born with those wings on. Is that correct? No, I was not. <laughs> okay. And does it hurt being attached? Oh no, not at all. Because I remember the wings from last year is what I remember. And I noticed the uh, rainbow colors. And what, what does that represent? Uh, they represent the colors of the gay pride flag. Okay. And to the rainbow, to the gay community, what does that mean to y'all? What does it mean? Uh, it's a form of identity. It's a form of uh, collaboration, showing that we support each other and that we're there and kind of show that we're not alone. There are many of us. Um, and uh, I mentioned earlier, do, do you know where the rainbow actually began, the first written thing about the rainbow? Well, I do now, after talking with you earlier. We actually did an interview, and I didn't have the mic on, so we're doing it a second time. Uh, and I was, I was telling Gary that uh, actually in the Bible is the first recorded rainbow that we know of. And it happens after God judged the world after the time of Noah and flooded the whole world, and the rainbow showed up. And it was a symbol of judgment by God that he was not going to uh, uh, destroy all the people by water once again. Now, the Bible says there's going to be another destruction coming, but it will not be by water. Right? And then I asked you, um, what, what is the, the best part about being in the... Uh, now, let me just get straight, since they don't know. Uh, are you homosexual? Yes, I am. Okay. And what's been the best part of the, the gay lifestyle for you? Um, just the friendship and the camaraderie and the support, being in the group, um, knowing that there's people there for you. Um, it's kind of like having a big family, right. except we're not related by blood. Uh, it's interesting, and I, and I just want to say to the camera that I was telling Gary earlier that one of the, the biggest things I hear from homosexuals is that there's, they feel such a camaraderie because you're going through the same thing, the same lifestyle, that there's, there's a bond and a friendship there that people talk about. And I relayed that also I was, saw a study on a Satanist and Satanic cults, and they actually do exit interviews when people leave the cult. And they, actually, and they ask them, why did they join? And the number one answer they always give is because they, they accepted them for just who they are. Right. Tall, short, fat, skinny, smart, dumb, poor, rich. It just didn't matter to them. And actually what's interesting, and that's what I've heard from a lot of homosexuals, is that they feel very accepted in the community. And I just want to say to Karen, if anybody is watching this in the church community, that we ought to have the same type of love for people who walk the streets and stuff like that, that they feel uh, welcome around us, that we do care about them the same way, and people in our churches who feel the same way also. Um, what has been the uh, the worst part of the gay lesson? Uh, the violence, the rude comments, uh, not being able to be with my partner walking down the street, and it be obvious that we are partners. Uh, because of worrying about somebody pulling over and either trying to start fights with this or in a lot of cases, uh, I know instances of drive-by shootings that have happened at gay bars and stuff like that, while people were yelling comments like fag and queer and stuff like that, just that's not being accepted by society as a whole is probably the worst part of it. Um, and I just want to say, I met you last year, I met you this year, do you, do you appreciate it that people would just walk up and chat with you instead of walking up and saying negative things or forcing things down your throat. You'd rather just have people walk up and chat with you. Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. It's nice to have people not shove things down your throat. Right. I, I come out here every year um, and talk to people, and I meet people multiple times, and they will always come up to me. And I, it's funny because if you take it and you shove it down someone's throat, they don't walk up that to you. Right. But when you just talk to people, you meet them all the time, and, right. and you do that. Um, well, you made a statement a few minutes ago about the rainbow. Yeah. Uh, the rainbow was God's way of judging, not man's con mankind's way of judging and that's a big problem now in reference to churches that I see is there's too much judging going on by those churches people should be accepted for who they are and you know what they what they do outside of church is not a relevant concept when it comes right down to it um, I'm a firm believer that God's here for all of us so you do believe there's a God yes I do and do you believe he's a judging God uh, uh, not to the extreme that's presented in churches, I don't. I believe he's a more accepting God than what a lot of religions present him as. Okay. And the, and you mentioned earlier that there had been some violent attacks against you when you were... Yes. Uh, not only in school, um, just, well, most people call it the normal things that happen in school, or kids will be kids, but in school as well as outside of school once I became an adult. And you had actually people physically hit, only hit you? Yes. 
Um, do you? Uh, um, I, we were talking earlier. One of the things about in the gay community, um, a lot of uh, a lot of disease in that community. And so my question is, have you had friends who have died from HIV or AIDS? Yes, I've had a lot of friends die from it. And uh, so you've been to funerals and stuff like that? Too many, to, well, not too many to count, but too many, way too many. Uh, how difficult is it to keep going to, because I'm sitting here and I'm, uh, I've been to three or four funerals in my life, but I know gay people who have been to three or four in months sometimes, let alone in the span they've been living a lifestyle out. How difficult has that been? Um, it's extremely difficult, but the one thing with working in medicine that I always keep in mind is for every life that goes, a new life comes. So, I mean, I know it's not a fair trade-off or a fair balance, but um, most of the friends that I've lost due to HIV, they were better that their time finally came. They had hit a point. Most of the friends I lost to HIV were prior to all the different treatments that they have out now. So now people who come up positive for HIV are living a lot longer, living a lot healthier lives. People that I've lost were a lot of them were before a lot of these new drugs had come out, and basically were in a time frame when if you became HIV positive, you basically died from it rather quickly instead of long term. You know, whether you're uh, HIV or AIDS or whether you're straight or gay or whatever, there's a hundred percent chance we're all going to die. Right. And so, what do you think, Gary, happens after we finally take our last heartbeat and we walk, we go off into eternity? What do you think happens next? Um. Honestly, I think we come back in a different form. I think souls keep coming back. Um, I'm not saying until we get things right or until we do things right like that. I just think we just rotate through the different planes. Okay, so you believe we reincarnate and come back. Yes. And then eventually, what do you think would be the, do you think there's an ultimate, like in Hinduism, they believe you reincarnate back until ultimately you get a nirvana, which is their heaven. Do you believe that's what it is? No. I just, I you think, just coming, right, I just think that we just keep coming back in one form or another. Energizer Bunny, just never right. stops. <laughs> um, and do you know what you were in a previous life? Um, no, I don't know anything or have no feelings in reference to my previous lives. And do you know what you're going to be in the next life? Um, I hope I can be at least the same man that I have been in this life or better myself at whatever extreme, but at least who I am now. So you believe you actually come back as another human being? You don't believe no, you come back as an animal or something? Not necessarily. I believe that you come back as some entity on this planet. Okay. And do you decide or does God decide? How does that work? Uh, I believe God decides. All right. And so you've mentioned God. In what particular belief or faith would you call yourself if you believe in God? I was raised Methodist. Okay, so you, so Methodist, so that's a, uh, a Christian faith. Would you fall, you think you fall more, more in line with the Christian faith? No, actually, I, as far as formalized religions, I don't really follow any formalized religion. Um, like, I don't believe you have to go to a, church, a building with a steeple on it and have a man sitting up in front of you preaching to you to go to church. Um, I believe church can be done as, as, much, as simply as a group of people getting together and having conversations like me and you are having now in reference to faith and their beliefs and that type of thing. Uh, do, since you grew up in Methodist, do you believe the Bible is true? I believe parts of it are true, but I think there's a lot of man's interpretation of those writings. And so how do you, as you, do you read the Bible? Um, not for a long time, I haven't. Okay. Um, and how do you, as you read it, how do you determine which parts are true and which parts aren't true? Um, I don't determine which parts are true and which parts aren't true. I believe that if we are true to ourselves and just good to other people, you know, I mean, as long as we're, how can I phrase it, um, as long as we don't hurt other mankind or animals and we're, you know, lead a good, healthy life, whether it be spiritually, physically, mentally, that you're fulfilling what you have to fill. So as long as we're good, we'll be okay with whatever happens next? I believe so. As I was reading the Bible one time, it actually lists a standard for being good called the Ten Commandments. Okay. Have you ever told a lie before? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, so what would that make you? Oh, uh, that it's a bad thing. <laughs> oh, no, no. If you murder someone, you're murder. If you rape, you're a rapist. If you tell a lie, you'd be a liar. You'd be a liar. Okay. You ever stole something before? No. Uh, you never nabbed something along the way of life that you shouldn't have I no. Did you ever cheat on a test in a school? No. You, were you ever at work and you're supposed to be working and you weren't working? Uh, no, actually, I work all the time when I'm at work. <laughs> I'm a workaholic. That's okay. that's my addiction in life. Is work. <laughs> One guy told me he said, uh, "Were you ever at work and you weren't working?" I, I said, "Yeah." He said, "We were stealing time from your employer." Oh, I was like, "That was a good point." No, um, have you company theft of property? Is what it's called. <laughs> have you ever uh, lusted in your heart before? Oh yeah. 
I had a guy tell me no the other day. I said, well, that proves you're a liar. I said, you're a fella, and uh, we lust. But this is what got me. Jesus said, even if you look upon someone with lust, it was the same as committing adultery, because he's checking insides as well as outsides. And I thought that was a pretty tough thing. Yeah, but isn't adultery only if there's another person involved with you? Adultery, I mean, if you're with somebody, whether it be marriage, engagement, anything like that, that's adultery if you're with another person. If you are single and by yourself, I don't think that would be considered adultery. Good point. Because in the Old Testament, adultery is actually the physical act between two people. Jesus went a step further. He said, I'm actually going to check your thoughts. That it, like if you're looking at pornography and you have lustful thoughts for someone that's not yours, Jesus said, I'm going to the thought life as well as the action life, which is a pretty tough standard. Right. Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? Mm, yeah. All right. Um, we've all JC or GD'd at some point. You know, we lost our cool or something, but that was blasphemy. Uh, you ever been angry with somebody? Yes. And Jesus even said, if you've been angry with someone without cause, all right, it was the same as committing murder. He's saying it's the same as pulling the trigger because he's going to check my thoughts, my insides, my outsides compared to my outsides. I've actually done prison ministry work before, and I've met murderers that before they ever pulled the gun on someone over a dice game or a wife, they lost the cool, first popped the cork, and then they, they, they went against that person and did that. All right? So going by that standard, you just told me you'd be a liar, an adulterer, a blasphemer, and a murderer by that standard. All right? So would you be guilty or not guilty on Judgment Day by that standard? Um, well, by those standards, I guess I'd be guilty. And would that mean, what's that mean? Would that mean uh, heaven or hell by that standard? By that standard, hell, I'm sure. Okay. And going by, what's that mean? And going by the uh, the Ten Commandments and. Oh my God, these are Christians. And going by. And going by the Ten Commandments and that standard, that would mean hell. But what that hit me was that would mean hell for six billion of us. Uh, it would mean. Uh, Yes, it is. It would mean uh, six billion of us would be guilty by that standard. Well, actually, by the standard, I'm sure the majority of us, the mass majority of us, would be guilty. And one thing that hit me was if six billion were guilty by that standard, I had a simple question during my search a few years ago, Gary, is um, uh, we would all be dying and going to hell unless God provided a way out. Now, growing up in your Methodist faith, do you know what that way out is? Uh, well, yeah, you admit your sins, you get saved, um, bat baptism. Um, okay. and, my understanding. Right. And what does the term save mean to you? Um, to me, it, well, according to my interpretation of religion, it means that you you absolved, had your sins absolved. And if I repent of my sin, turn from my sin, okay, and um, get saved, surrender my heart to Jesus Christ, God actually takes the blood of Jesus and washes you as pure and as white as snow, erases all your sin, okay. Um, and then if I'm washed clean of my sin, I would be right with God when I walk out of here. All right? Now, you've heard that. Uh -huh. And do you do you think that is the right answer when we walk out of here? Do you think it's the right answer? Um, yes and no. I mean, I just, it's all, a, it's an interpretation thing. To me, it is. Um, I mean, what, you know, like most people say, being a homosexual is a sin. But I look at it as, for as long as I have known, even before I knew what sex was about, I was always more attracted to men than women. So, I, in my opinion, I feel I was born a homosexual. How's your, how's your relationship with your father? Um, I have a fine relationship with everybody in my family. So your father, uh, he's been part of your life the whole time growing up in Yes. Yes. Um, uh, again, a personal question. You don't have to answer it if you don't want to. Uh, were you ever molested as a kid? No. What was in, again, you don't have to answer this. Uh, what was your first, uh, how old were you at your first sexual experience? Uh, 14. 14. And was that male to male? Uh, no, actually it was male to female. You know what's interesting? I just saw um, a study the other day that said 91% of all homosexuals have slept with at least one woman. Um, at some point in time, I know when I was growing up, it was what was expected of me from society. So I li lived basically a double life. Part of my life was hidden from society, and I led my life as a straight person. So you were doing both those at the same time? Yes. Um, because what hit me was is if 91% if have, have slept with a woman at some point in their life, wouldn't it be a choice? Go ahead and pop it if you want. Big umbrella. I like that. Uh, we don't get the <laughs> wings. Protect the wings too. Yeah, we don't want to get, get the wings. Uh, yeah, that's fine. I'm, don't worry about me. Okay. Um, uh, that 91% of, of homosexual men have slept with at least one woman. So mm -hmm. if that's the case, wouldn't it be, instead of born that way, wouldn't it be a choice that they're making at that point? No. Well, that all depends on how you look at it. I didn't say that when I did sleep with a woman that I was 
got anything from it or was interested in it or anything like that. I slept with females because society said I had to. Okay. That was my way of keeping from getting my excuse expression kicked when I was growing up. Right. Okay. Um, which, if it happens once, you don't want it to happen twice. Correct. Yeah. Um, do Do you? The Bible says there's a heaven or a hell when you die. Do you think that's a, a possibility when you walk out of here? I think it's a possibility. Um, I don't think the way heaven and hell is represented as far as hell being a place of fire and brimstone and flames and all of that, I don't know if I would agree to that extreme. Right. Um, I just, I don't know. I believe there's a higher power and a lower power, uh, like a positive and a negative. Um, and so your soul goes back to the positive or the negative? Correct. And then you Correct. reincarnate back? Correct. Um, you heard of uh, Charles Barkley, the basketball player? Uh -huh. uh, we played at uh, Auburn University together a few years ago, and we used to room together on road trips and stuff, so I've been friends with him for a while. Uh, but his younger brother had a heart attack and died, but he came back. Uh, you heard about near-death experiences, right lights, mm -hmm. tunnels, people say, Gary? Mm -hmm. Not what he saw. He flatlined. Uh, spirit rose up. He could see the flatline. He took off to the waiting room to tell you who was in the waiting room, what they were saying, what they were wearing when he was clinically flatlined. Okay, so it can't just be in his head. This has to be external. Right. That's what happened. That's when he took off on a journey. All of a sudden, he saw trees on fire, ground smoldering on the trees. He saw a lake of fire in front of him when he died. All right? Mm -hmm. He said, Daryl, what did you see, dude? He said, I saw hell. I said, dude, you saw hell. Gary, he'll tell you to this day what he saw is more real than this area right here around Atlanta. Yes, but he's also grown up his entire life with the impression that hell is lights of fire, everything burning. Watch this. He said you could literally feel the heat coming off that lake of fire. It was so intense. It's been proved over and over again with many, many studies. Enough mental impressions put into your head can make anything seem real. I've studied um, near-death experiences and. The one thing they always take to look for is what's called corroborating evidence. Something there's no way they could know why they were flatlined. Okay. And there's no way he could know who was in the waiting room, what they were saying, what they were wearing when he was clinically flatlined. Because if it was just in his head, he would have stayed in his body right, right. there. And any near-death experiences that have corroborating evidence, they, you always give more credence to when that happens. And I have literally met six or seven different people, Gary, that got the, the hell experience and not the heaven experience. All right? Okay. And so my question then is, because the Bible says there's a heaven or hell, Many people have gotten the hell experience when they have flatlined, all right? Mm -hmm. What if you're wrong and you decide to reject what Jesus Christ did? What if you're wrong when you walk out and he's actually the only way to get to heaven? Okay, well, let me ask you a question. Okay. What if you're wrong? Okay. Uh, I think it's a legitimate question. If I'm wrong, uh, one, I've, I've actually believed, I took time to study different religions, so I've actually put a faith commitment on something that um, actually has evidence to back it up. I didn't, I didn't try to blindly follow anything. Uh, I grew up Catholic, but I studied a bunch of different religions before I chose Christianity. Ah. All right. Uh, two, uh, my life has changed. I have been on both sides of the fence as far as major sin and trying to be a Christian. Uh, I'll take this life over the next one any day, or the way I used to live. Right. And three, I die and I go to my grave, and that's it. Right. But if you're wrong, what would that mean? Then. I guess if you believe in the hell aspect of it, then I guess I'll be in hell. But I, you know, I don't believe that just because I'm gay, I'm going to go to hell. Um, I mean, if you want to look at what, what are classified as sins, that's really my only major sin is according to, quote unquote, established religions, is being gay. Outside of that, I'm very helpful to people. I do whatever I can to help mankind. I'm more about pressuring positive energies than negative energies. Yeah, just because the Islamic faith actually believes there's um, a good angel on one shoulder, writes on every good deed you do, bad angel on found an angel on the other, so writes every bad deed you do, and they get flopped on a scale in front of Allah, and they weigh out the good and bad deed. If it tilts towards good, you get paradise. If it tilts towards bad, you get hellfire. Because I was always of the thought, well, God's just going to weigh these out. But then even when you read the book of Revelations, it says that all liars will have their place in the lake which burns with fire. But it says liars and murderers and sorcerers and different things. See, I don't always equate lying with murder, right. but to a holy, righteous, pure God, one sin is just as nasty as another sin to God on that. Okay? Um, what, uh, you have been great to talk with. What, uh, what can I answer for you? What can I encourage you with? What can we do? I'm sorry? Anything I can answer for you or encourage you with? You've been great to chat. No, actually, I'm very comfortable with who I am and where my place is, and I mean... So, no, I'm fine. <laughs> and um, I just want to appreciate, uh, thank you for your openness. Uh, as you chatted with this, I just think you've been very open and honest, and I just appreciate that so much. Are, are you a reader you like to read? Yes. I'm actually, uh, since I met you, uh, well, last year I had him last year, but I have a book out 
and we're actually working on a DVD series and stuff. But actually, uh, my first book is out. I'd like to sign and give you a copy. That'd be okay. Okay, that's fine. That's a deal. Gary, you've been great. Thanks. Thank you so much. Awesome. Good seeing you, Gary.